Активные мероприятия говорите. Будущее покажет. Добро пожаловать на виртуальный саммит Апкод. Hi everyone and uh, welcome back uh, to Upcut. This is edition four. I'm your host Matt Swish. So for those who are coming for the first time, I'm gonna re-explain the concept of Upcut. Uh, hopefully everything is going well. If there is any issue, like uh, please uh, let me know uh, in the chat. Uh, there is few changes and few things that uh, hopefully have improved. You know, so uh, I'm really looking forward to hear your feedback uh but uh yeah so i hope everything is okay i hope uh, you are all, all right wherever you are if you're in kenya or in the us or like uh, anywhere and if it's morning time uh, to you good morning and uh, if it's evening you know like uh, well thanks for watching us before going to bed uh so today is uh, our fourth edition and I'm still a bit surprised and every time I'm launching, I'm still a bit like uh, stressed, you know, because I'm wondering like, oh, is anything going to mess up uh, because it's live? Uh, but hopefully everything goes well. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, I used to run, like I ran my first conference in France uh, 10 years ago. It was called the uh, Akito Agosum, then No Such Con. And then a few years ago, I started a new one called the uh, Opcode uh, in Dubai. And we also uh, took it to Kenya. Uh, but obviously, because of confinement, uh, we were not planning to do uh, an edition this year. Uh, but even on top of uh, <laughs> even on top of uh, yeah, confinement, organizing a conference is a lot of work, and it's very difficult to have the right reach uh, for your audience because usually it's only like the attendees that are going to be. Uh, uh, coming so going virtual was uh, a good opportunity and more than happy to have this fourth edition so the format uh, so if you are interested as an attendee or a future speaker uh, so for attendees because it's live you can always ask questions in the chat or even provide feedback or ideas uh, so at this time we're gonna have a theme and obviously uh, the theme uh, for today is gonna be uh, our favorite, especially uh, in the US uh, now, like there is a huge uh, <laughs> interest for all their uh, Russian activities. So the theme today uh, is going to be around active measures and, uh, and Russia, as you can uh, tell from the waiting page. Uh, but um, yeah, so if you have ideas for a theme, uh, some, some of them uh, for like the next editions are like uh, privacy, security and journalism, hardware security. Um, like uh, OS security, so OS intelligence also, we're trying to keep it like really wide so we get uh, different things. And if you're interested as a speaker, so the call for paper is always uh, available on the website. So you just need to go uh, here. Um, so there's the call for paper button and the format so you can come with your slides but if you don't have slides or if uh, you already published a blog post about uh, something if it's interesting it doesn't matter uh, we're more than happy to give you a platform so you can reach a broader audience uh, <laughs> fuzzing i mean uh, are people still talking about fuzzing uh dave <laughs> but uh yeah so uh, more than happy to also like uh, provide a platform to security researchers to promote their blog post you know uh, like we have few people who just came with the blog post and we just present it like this uh, as long as the content is interesting uh, more than happy to uh, to host you and there is so many like things going on now that uh, also I think it's a good excuse also for me to bring like, people so they can just talk about their, their research and then uh, to have like a summary so for talks, usually the format is 30 minutes. Uh, when we have panel, it's 45 minutes. And then sometimes we have a uh, uh, virtual, virtual guest like uh, Dave Vettel, you know? <laughs> Team, ancient bugs. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, who, who knows? I'm sure we would uh, figure some interesting stuff. That's basically what uh, Juan did uh, last time, you know, when he was talking about uh, yeah, the checkpoint paper. If you're talking about the, the blog post that they wrote uh, based on one uh, presentation from last time, yeah, definitely that. Definitely ancient bugs. Uh, but that was still pretty interesting. 
Um, we also started a community on Discord, so we're almost like 200 people now uh, in like a almost two weeks. Uh, and if you uh, you will see in the chat, you know, like there's some people from like uh, Discord also speaking. Uh, that's pretty good. Uh, so obviously, if you're here, you already know uh, where you can watch uh, the stream. Uh, small parenthesis uh, for uh, this time, you can uh, give donation. Uh, in the top right corner if you go on the website and it goes to uh, MSF so Doctors Without Borders uh, because they're raising money uh, for the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic so I thought it would be a good opportunity to uh, encourage people to uh, donate for that uh, so yeah if you want to donate for something you can just click here and it goes uh, straight to uh, their uh, campaign uh, so our agenda for today is obviously we have uh, a very special guest uh, for our keynote uh, speaker uh, with uh, Thomas who actually just released uh, his book uh, around like two weeks ago uh, so we're really happy to have him here and that should be like uh, pretty interesting and uh, so that should be pretty fun so if you have some good questions you know like you know you can already like start to prepare them or type them in the chat uh, then we have uh, Maddie from uh, Google Project Zero, so also very excited to have uh, Maddie uh, in this show. Uh, that should be like pretty cool. Uh, so from what I've read, that's our first time actually looking at Windows. Uh, <laughs> that that our, our blog post is pretty good also. Uh, like you know, it's an example of blog posts that are like pretty cool. You know, it's much better than a lot like eighty percent of presentations out there. Um, and then we have. Uh, another like a uh, uh, dear friend uh, coming over so uh, Ryan Naren uh, from security conversations uh, is gonna be uh, with us also so if you have been here a few times you probably have seen him speaking here he's also quite active in the chat uh, he also has this really good podcast called security conversations so if you ever get bored you know you can always check out his podcast I think he has like more than 50 uh, like interviews of like uh, security people uh, that are like all like pretty cool. Like the last interview is from the red team lead of uh, Walmart. So I encourage you to uh, listen to it. And even like a few weeks ago, uh, he, di he did one about uh, Opcot, which was, um, you know, now it's featuring on the website. So it's definitely like pretty good. Uh, so that should be like quite interesting. And he's going to be interviewing Bill. Uh, with uh, one of the uh, young and bright talent from the uh, infosec uh, scene, so that's uh, you know it's always good to highlight talent. Uh, there's so many like uh, people like hunting for like XSS and stuff that when there is actually like uh, you know like someone who is like from the new generation doing like cool research, you know I think it's worth uh, you know interviewing them and kind of giving them a platform and looking at their research uh, so people don't fall into the habit of uh, XSS. Um, and uh, last but not least, we're going to have uh, Mohamed Fata from uh, Trend Micro, who's going to talk about uh, Pure Basic. And uh, yeah, that's a pretty good like uh, presentation. Uh, I've seen the slides, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, quite, uh, it's quite solid. So there is like some proper research behind it. Um, so yeah, that should be uh, pretty cool. So now we're going to get ready for our uh, keynote speaker. So uh, who's going to be Thomas. So Thomas, you can already start sharing your screen. And I will unmute you in a sec. Um, but uh, yeah. So I see like the first thing topic is uh, getting a lot of people excited. Um, yeah, yeah, you can share your screen and then I will uh, announce it. Uh, I will announce you. Активные мероприятия Говорича. Будущее покажет. Добро пожаловать на виртуальный саммит Upcode. Okay, thank you much for the uh, introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to speak here uh, today. Uh, I understand that we will have some audience interaction when you read the comments to me because I'm not watching the YouTube channel. 
with you at the same time because it's time delayed. So <laughs> I will be uh, um, uh, talking about the first hack forge leak operation. Often uh, people forget the middle aspect here, the forging. Uh, there are obviously hack and leak cases, but some of the uh, most significant instances contain elements of, of forgeries. Context here is, of course, that the entire disinformation uh, conversation is uh, at the top of the news ag agenda these days. And I thought um, I, I, we should really put this particular instrument of hacking and leaking into historical context. So that's what I'm going to do today. The point of departure here is that really to understand cyber operations in the 21st century, we first have to understand intelligence operation in the 20th, 20th century. That, of course, also applies to uh, COVID action, if you like, uh, disinformation, um, or what CIA called political warfare in the 1950s. We have to understand how, this, how the logic of this activity worked in the um, pre-internet age to really appreciate what's going on today. And this is not just a historian's gimmick, me saying this. I say this because for the old cases, we have the memos, we have the original pro project proposals, the uh, approval, uh, the authorizations, the budget requests, etc. So we can learn an incredible amount of, um, we get a lot of insight from these cases that we just don't have if we look at the, the, digi di at the digital output, at the exhaust of these operations. So let me give you a quick example of what I think is perhaps the most stunning forgery and leak that we saw in the uh, Cold War. It, um, it came to the, um, it started in the late 60s already, but really came, came to the fore in the 1970s. It, it was replayed the same forgery more than 20 times over at about a dozen years. And you will understand why in just a moment. Uh, suddenly uh, in uh, 69, Around Christmas time, the a Norwegian socialist newspaper called Orientering was first surfacing uh, top secret uh, American war plans and under a Christmas tree. Um, the story didn't really catch uh, uh, on then. Um, it was picked up again by a far left um, German magazine called Konkret, a link to, uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, and uh, But even then, the story didn't really catch on. Uh, we have the full leak. I was able to track it down from the end of the 1970s. And here's the cover page of the full leak uh, of, the, of all the documents that KGB leaked at the time, more than 120 pages, most of them top secret documents. So the first question when, these, when the leak surfaced was, where on earth uh, does this come from? So... Um, I'll answer that question in a moment, but uh, let's quickly look at, the, at, the, at an interesting forgery that is in there. In that stack of paper, in those 120 pages, there was one uh, page that looked like this, top secret, it looked genuine, and it had suggestions on edits, how to make changes to existing uh, top secret documents. And it contained um, this paragraph here that I'm going to zoom into. Um, that talked about the release authority of nuclear weapons. And if you read this in context, it becomes clear that this is not a real, not the real thing. It's, it's a very unrealistic uh, thing that they suggest in that paragraph. It's, it's underlined. The U.S. Army doesn't underline in, in this document, in those documents at the time. And the entire tone of the whole uh, of the edits page is just off. And you can tell if you, you know, if you read a bunch of these documents, you can tell that something isn't quite right. But it's a very high quality forgery. It's easy to fall for the forgery. And that's indeed what happened. They mailed out the forgery with the help of a defector in, a German defector actually, in, uh, in Moscow. And... Um, mailed it from Rome to a number of journals. And one Italian journal, ABC at the time, also a far left political magazine um, that sort of weirdly combined uh, like um, explicit adult content with, uh, in this case, military planning and political scandals more broadly. You can see the headline at the top. They use these cheap journalistic outlets because they reached a large number of people and the quality of the um, journalistic 
work was you know lower than in other more highbrow journals. So it was quite helpful to have this you know this weird combination of sex and and scandal. Um, let me just give you uh, what happened in, in Germany because it's the most extraordinary thing. In Germany, the uh, operation here played out in weekly magazines as well. And I would just point out that KGB surfaced the operation to Stern, which is also uh, often with explicit content at the time, which ran with a story and completely bought the framing that was provided in that fake document page that I just showed you. Then the Spiegel, which is a more serious, more slightly more highbrow weekly magazine also run out of Hamburg, also received the documents, but did something else. They turned the disinformation story itself into the story. You can see the disinformation here on the uh, in the story itself. This is from Spiegel, not Stern. Now, the Spiegel here also revealed, and you can see the face of this gentleman here, Robert Lee Johnson. Um, here, uh, the Spiegel revealed the actual source, namely a Russian spy in the US Army in the 1960s. That's him. Um, so the Spiegel did something extraordinary. They authenticated the source of the documents, and that's that was breaking, you know, news, completely fresh reporting, extremely well done on their part, which then confronted KGB with a with a fascinating dilemma. They basically had pushed information out, partly forged but mostly correct. Some journals fell for it; others exposed them. So what do you do next? So KGB decided, okay, let's double down, let's reward Stern, the, the German magazine that ran with their story, and send them more documents, this time even more uh, explosive documents. And they sent nuclear yield requirement lists, top secret American uh, war plans that I was able to track down. And this is a, a target listing here that contains, you can see it contains West German targets. West German cities as nuclear targets. Obviously, a massive story that Spiegel, excuse me, that Stern now knew came from KGB because that the story had just broken. But they also knew this this was huge in terms of you know media newsworthiness. So they decided to publish again, this time knowingly uh, spreading information that came from a hostile intelligence agency, and assuming the information was correct. I think correctly assuming that the information was correct and not forged. So uh, they st the operation started out with a forgery covert, then turned into an overt operation without a forgery uh, as far as we know. Operational adaptation on the part of KGB here. So let's uh, move forward to the present. And I'm gonna give you just one case study that echoes with this one, and I'll do that in just a few minutes. The anonymous movement pops up in the early 2000s, um, which is an important piece of context here. What also pops up is the phenomenon of leaking becomes something positive. WikiLeaks, of course, uh, Cablegate, uh, the big State Department leak, and of course, Edward Snowden become cultural icons something that is for, to many people, obviously not to all, but to many people, something positive. So leaking becomes suddenly synonymous almost with transparency. And of course, this is perfect. If, you, if you're sitting in, in uh, you know, Russian foreign intelligence and you, you see the rise of leaking as a cultural phenomenon, you're like, oh my God, this is the best. We now have a website. We can just push out content camouflaged as anonymous uh, activism and, and, and run operations this way, which is exactly what happened next. In March 2014 in Ukraine, you can see in that picture, uh, uh, at the time, Lieutenant Colonel Jason Gresh, US Army Foreign Area Officer in, based in Kiev, in the embassy, explaining something to um, uh, Ukrainian officers here. Uh, then suddenly on, a, on, a, on an anonymous uh, uh, website, this leak pops up. Anonymous Ukraine hack correspondent of US Army attache assistant in Kiev and discover plot against Ukraine. Now, when I found this, uh, I was got excited. Uh, this is a 
picture of uh, one of the Ukrainian colonels, because the text of that anonymous post, uh, let's look at it a little more closely, mentions that Jason, Jason Gresh, the American officer, writes to Igor Protsik. Uh, this, this is a picture of Igor Protsik, a Ukrainian senior officer in the general staff. And they also contain the, the file uh, links here. They're not active anymore when I find this, but they contain the name of this leak. And I'm like, oh, this is exciting. Surely I will be able to find this leak uh, somewhere. That so I turned to the internet and uh, here it gets um, a little uh, exciting because it turns out it's really hard to find the Protsik leak. The, the file sharing links are not online anymore, not active anymore. I can't find the actual file. Uh, I can't retro hunt on virus total because it's way too long ago. So um, what can I do? So finally I find a hash in some dark internet forum. I find a hash that um, corresponds to the file name. And I managed to pull up the uh, actual leak. You can see it's the Protsik 7z file from virus total with the help of the uh, hash. And it's interesting because the first submission is exactly uh, one day after it appeared on that anonymous forum. So I found the leak. So let's look at it. Um, amazingly, the people who uh, uh, went in and obviously forged emails that were not uh, in actually in Protsix inbox, so they hacked uh, Vigo Protsix inbox, Gmail inbox, and did, did not discover anything interesting in that inbox. It was simply you know flight bookings and some travel uh, reservations and whatnot, nothing of real interest. A, a few emails from the, from uh, Jason Gresh, but nothing actually of of interest to Protsix. So they say, okay, let's just copy paste some of the headers, change some of the ID uh, numbers in the headers, and just come up with emails that are more interesting. So they literally forge three emails, put them into a folder called most interesting, and leak the emails. Um, and it, it is most interesting. At that point, I get really excited and uh, start looking at the emails more specifically. So there, there's a sequence of three emails. Uh, there's Jason Gresh. This is fake Jason Gresh, just to be clear, instructing the Ukrainian general staff um, to attack an air base in the, uh, actually just abs abstractly instructing them to go forward with their plan. And the entire language in the email is completely uh, weird. So it, obviously to anybody who understands, who's ever studied um, uh, interacted with uh, senior officers in, in the US or NATO or anything, you instantly can tell this email, it's a very bad fake, unlike the one in the 70s. This is really badly done. Uh, next uh, email is from Protsik to a local um, commander in, the, in Eastern Ukraine. And finally, the plan to attack a, an airbase. So here, I just want to sort of tease out what's going on. We have here an extremely convoluted forgery. The forgery is that an American colonel instruct, instructs the Ukrainian can, uh, general staff to f attack a Ukrainian airbase and frame the Russians. So this is basically a conspiracy to frame Russia in attacking Ukraine. But of course, the whole thing is basically a conspiracy folded into another conspiracy. Um, and, and this is uh, helpful because it just shows you the depth uh, of essentially of conspiratorial planning going on here. Um, you know, writing this book really messed with my mind because initially I, I thought, well, of course, this, this can't be true because it's way too convoluted. This is a, must be a conspiracy. But then, of course, you come across these uh, weirdly complex plots like this one and, and you're like, okay, this is... Uh, it's just odd. What happened next is interesting. Uh, the story gets pushed out by Russian state uh, media, um, Voice of Russia at the time, now Sputnik, um, or, or formerly part of it. Um, you have here um, uh, a video that, that is put out, camouflaged as anonymous, um, uh, just turning the story into, into something, trying to blow up that, that, that forgery, that story. Um, the just one final observation on this on this weird uh, forgery here it was the forgery was not particularly well done so a lot of people in the us uh, government in the us embassy assumed that 
this would not have a major effect because it was so obviously badly done. But if you talk to the Ukrainian general staff about the operation, they are less sure. They basically say, okay, listen, you need to understand this in its actual context. Uh, Igor Protsik, the uh, you know victim of, of the forgery here and the hack, he told me that, I'm paraphrasing, he said, listen, I went to Soviet military school. I was taught to run operations like this. So the Ukrainian general staff, I understand, assumed that they were looking at a GRU operation here. Um, and um, But they also understood, um, I think, that the operation, uh, although it was not particularly sh shrewd, especially the English language part, was uh, effective against the population in eastern, southeastern Ukraine, because they were not used to seeing Ukrainian um, armored personnel carriers and army personnel on the ground. So there was a lot of distrust that they, uh, that this operation tried to exploit. So don't judge an operation based on the lack of its sophistication, either technically or indeed um, in, term, in terms of its, you know, execution more broadly. Um, yes. Uh, I will close just by observing that uh, in early 2014, the oper operational pace really turns uh, up. We have another uh, leak forge operation just a couple of weeks later in the context of the Ukrainian elections in, in May 2014, where the election results of the Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian Election Commission were forged. This is also a forgery that was pushed out uh, to the media uh, pretty aggressively at a critical moment. Um, I think I will stop here and start taking a few questions and maybe we can tease out some other aspects of the operation in the Q&A. Oh, I will make one uh, quick observation. I tried to um, uh, I tried to confirm that Igor Protsik was targeted by, you know, APT28 or Fancy Bear, however you want to call them, um, through known databases that uh, contain list listings of targets. Um, the there are several, um, not all of them are widely known. One of them is the famous bit.ly um, data, that bit.ly data that were created, the target list that were created because they made a mistake in, in the link shortening um, of phishing emails. Uh, Protzig is not in that particular database. I was unable to find his particular email in other uh, company um, repositories and companies who track this operation. Uh, if, if any if any of you can um, have, have, have access to early uh, APT28 targeting data, I'd be interested in, in checking. Um, but I think most companies started tracking a little later in 2014. So that's the explanation most likely. Um, uh, yeah, thank you for, for your attention for now. Uh, thanks, Thomas uh yeah definitely one uh one question before like we uh start with the questions uh for, from the from the chat uh what's that uh dark obscure uh, form that you are mentioning at the beginning like uh <laughs> it feels like it's an interesting detail that you just uh, purposely omitted i'm sorry wh where's the I, I didn't understand the question i apologize oh what's sorry the... wh what is the uh form that you were mentioning the dark obscure <laughs> form <laughs> oh, from the ash. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, great question. I, uh, you know, I, I, I try to reconstruct how I found the hash at the time. And, uh, and I, uh, to be blunt, I forgot. <laughs> I, 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 couldn't, also, I couldn't pull it up again. So I, I apologize. But, but the that doesn't mean the evidence is not good. Okay. okay. It just sounded more cool to say it was an obscure form. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, a question from Ryan. Uh, when you're writing a book, how do you know uh, when it's done and how do you decide when it's the right time to stop? Oh, wow. That's a tough question. Um, well, if your publisher is breathing down your neck uh, with a deadline, um, that certainly helps to decide when to stop. Um, in, this case, uh, in this case, it was hard to decide when to stop because when I started writing this book about the history of disinformation, I thought, surely I'm... Um, I wanted, can I really fill like a thick book with a story? And very quickly it became clear, oh my God, um, I could write two uh, at least uh, books about this. So um, I had to make a selection. Obviously that was difficult. Oh yeah, I mean, if you, if you do a history of disinformation, yeah, definitely it's uh, an encyclopedia in a few volumes because there's, uh, yeah. 
I mean, I actually, I have another question. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, about, like, you know, like for disinformation, you know, we uh, do hear a lot about Russia. Uh, it keeps coming, like, uh, back, like, for the past, like, five, six years. We do hear a lot about Russia. Are you planning yeah. to write about, like, other countries uh, in the near future? Or, like, why do you think people are also yeah. talking so much about Russia? Like, what, what are, like, your opinion about it? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. The 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 book is not just about Russian operations. I just I portray a number of very extensive American operations, East German operations, mm -hmm. um, Bulgarian Czech operations, um, of course, uh, and, and and Soviet. Uh, but of course, Russia more recently has has uh, started in the most visible way. But if you go if you go just one year forward from May 2014, um, some of you, I'm sure you have heard of the Wiki Saudi leaks case, the alleged Yemen cyber army leak um, of Saudi foreign ministry files that pops up in uh, in 2015, in around June 2015. It, that's a difficult one to attribute because there are forensic indicators that point to two alternative explanations. Either it's a Russian operation or an Iranian operation or some so, sort of weird combination of both. Um, and it looks to me personally, I, I'm, I've changed my assessment in this in this case based on new evidence. And I think it's not unlikely that it's actually an Iranian operation, um, at least in part. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a fascinating case to look at. Iran was active in this space quite early, as early as 2011. And um, and certainly uh, escalated since. Yeah, that uh, that makes sense. Uh, another question is, what are your thoughts about the nature of disinformation related to COVID nineteen, namely the suggestion that China is adopting uh, Russian tactics? Yeah, that's a tough one um, because, of course, you know some. The, the the scholar and the researcher in me is very cautious at this point because I can only see some of the output of operations, and you know the writing this history made me very um, cautious because as soon as the Cold War ends, we just don't have access to the memos anymore, to the actual files, and um, you know assessing the operation that I just described is actually really hard because uh, I don't have high really high quality uh, forensics or high quality documents to prove anything here. Um, so in the COVID case, that of course is also true. Having said that, some state, Chinese state media put out information or you know, campaigns almost. Some of you may have seen this video of the, the, the comic of the Statute of Liberty talking to a Chinese nurse about the uh, crisis COVID response. That's a pretty impressive piece of, uh, of um, you know, of advertising, if you like, on the Chinese government's part. So they're certainly getting aggressive, but I think it's worth highlighting that some of that most of what they do is very ham-fisted and very clumsy, um, almost as clumsy as what we see from the uh, U.S. administration, of course. Um, yeah, actually, a side comment from uh, Kostin Ryu. Uh, I guess everyone is adapting or adopting those uh, old school, like all these but gold these tactics nowadays. For instance, uh, Czech lab uh, Durtegan. Uh, I guess that's true, yeah. Uh, I I think you know. I think when the internet really became became a th big thing in the nineteen nineties and early two thousands, there was a lot of utopianism and optimism. And I think even the infosec community today, although many of us are so cynical, we are still influenced by that uh, by that extra extraordinary amount of optimistic thinking i think it's we, sh we should st in my mind still expect more forgeries um uh, more i mean we should be more distrustful than we already are i think that's that's a personal lesson that i took away from studying that history so it's not it's not uh, just going it's not necessarily going back to old school tactics these tactics were always used it's just that we haven't forgotten about them in the, in the meantime yeah it's true uh people do have a short memory uh there is a, a question it's a bit long it's probably written by an academic uh, so i may have to read it twice uh in your book you mentioned that disinformation resists metrics 
Uh, if more data generally meant more reliable metrics, then the internet had the reverse effect on the old art of political warfare. In this light, is there a way to measure this information? Um, yeah, I'm, I think the, the, the logic of, of most uh, disinformation active measures is that they, that they take existing prejudices, existing all, often facts. Um, and, and, you know, the operation that I described from the 1970s is a brilliant example. There was a genuine fear of nuclear war in the 1970s in Germany and France, elsewhere, everywhere. So that was perfect for disinformation because you could tap into that existing fear and, and exacerbate it. So how do you measure how, by how much you exacerbated something that is already powerful? Um, I don't think there's any measurement device that we have for this. Uh, and the technology that we use don't, doesn't change anything. It's a psychological dynamic. Yeah, I mean, we can see it like for like threat intelligence related to disinformation are still pretty weak. Uh, a, few, a few weeks ago, we had uh, Sarah Jen from uh, Coxsack Lab that was explaining the work they're doing with the... Um, uh, it, like it's similar to like the MITRE uh, attack framework, but just for disinformation. Uh, it's called Amit, and basically to mm -hmm. have like a basically a framework where at least you could leverage like existing threat intelligence platform that we use for malwares, where yeah. you could like start to index like disinformation campaign at least like to have more information that can be like uh, re uh, searchable, which is also one of the problem now. Like uh, like you said, you know, yeah. like you have to go on like on uh, random forums, and it's very difficult to keep track of where you get the information and something if you hear something. Uh, I mean, I guess especially for disinformation. You know, it's, it, there's so many, uh, what I find so fascinating about studying active measures is that you come across contradictions all the time mm -hmm. because active measures are ultimately about, con about exacerbating contradictions. That's the whole premise. And one of them is on, on metrics. So for example, although it is still, I would argue, impossible to measure the effect, it is possible to measure the lack of effect. Um, because you do have metrics for something that didn't happen. So I think paradoxically, we can show that operations have failed. It's just hard to show how well they have succeeded because you would have to ha have to run a counterfactual experiment in order to come to that um, you know, answer. Uh, and then the other one is um, that, of course, in, for attribution, um, technology and specific indicators and, uh, and forensics can be extremely helpful. So we can have a faster attribution cycle than we had in the past. Also, we ha can have faster operational adaptation than we had in the past. So there are a number of interesting changes, no question. Yeah, I mean, you could argue that the uh, fast attribution uh, factor is also a bad thing, you know, because people are very quick to point like fingers at the country. So uh, for sure, at some point, it's going to be abused. If it's not already abused, we start to see, I mean, it's been like almost like 10 years. People are talking about it for malware when people started to be like, oh, it's really trendy to just like, you know, like the attribution dice type of thing where like you just roll it and just like read the country that's under the dice. Uh, there is no way, like, yeah. especially for something as old as this information that people are just not like, well, we know like those countries are using those tactics. Well, what about we just simulate it? and do that like i think like uh was it today or yesterday like facebook just released uh the new report for like cib uh i mean uh, if i recall correctly there is a campaign in mauritania uh, that was involving uh, a paid campaign of almost 200 dollars you know so, <laughs> so uh, because we don't have any information about oh they get it you know like uh i i, I was uh, telling a friend i was like i'm almost tempted to like start to run like some like well, obviously you can because like you're probably gonna get in trouble with law enforcement. But like to like uh, run like fake campaigns to see if they're gonna come up with like some random attribution, you know? Uh, yeah. So absolutely. I mean, the, the, but on the attribution side, um, maybe also hi history can be a little helpful there because we should not assume that the if you have an active measure that you're trying to attribute the controversy will not go away, even if you have extremely high quality um, uh, forensic indicators and data available. Even if you have certainty um, 
in attribution, that doesn't mean the debate will go away because the actual prejudices, the raw material that helped the active measure to succeed also means that the controversy will continue no matter how good the evidence is. That was yeah. also the case in the past. Oh, definitely. So we shouldn't, I mean, we shouldn't assume that we will convince anybody. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree with you because, uh, like you said, you know, in a lot of cases, like attribution is there, and we know which country is doing what, and they've been doing it for like decades, and uh, yeah. yeah, it does not change much uh, to the narrative. I just don't want to them countries to not get in trouble uh, with people, but yeah. Uh, I mean, it, uh, uh, sorry. No, no, like, uh, like keep going. I was about no, to I jump was, to another I, I question, saying, so if you have another comment, uh, go ahead. Just quick comment. I think the narrative, the narrative. We can change the dominant narrative, and I think it matters what people of influence uh, say. Uh, and and you can change the the minds of you know a significant number of people. In fact, whether somebody is willing to change their mind based on new evidence to me is is one of the most interesting questions. Because those people who don't have the capacity and the willingness to change their mind based on new evidence, they're just not. I just don't take take them seriously. So changing. That that is a key feature. Any anybody who does investigations will intuitively understand what I mean. You have to be able to take new evidence on board. Uh, another question is hoping to get uh, hands on your book. Uh, besides similarities, what differences between twenty C offline and twenty one C online operations would you point out? I don't know what's 20C um, offline and 21C uh, online. So if you can also explain to... Uh, yeah, pro probably 20th century offline and 21st century online operations, what the difference oh, is. Yeah. Okay, okay. That makes sense. Um, the, I'll just name, make a big observation here. So 21st century leaks have a much higher volume. I mean, 100, 120 pages was large in the 1970s. It's tiny, uh, you know, today. So what does the volume of leaks imply? And the question, the answer there is, I think, uh, one thing is that if you have, if you if you do a small leak, and that includes forged documents also, then you really have to do it's very crafty. You have to really know what you're doing. You take it takes handiwork. It takes skill. It takes um, it takes uh, it's like artisanal really. And mm -hmm. if you do a leak that is high volume, um, and mostly true, maybe only has a few false uh, cover stories involved, like claiming it's from the DNC while in fact it's not from the DNC, which was actually the case. Um, that is 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 very industrial scale leaking. You just put out a lot of content. And the value add is not your uh, artisanal craftsmanship. The value add is created by journalists and other researchers going in uh, and then turning the leak in, finding the interesting tidbits. So Matt, I'm going yeah. to provoke you. In a way, uh, Shadow Brokers weaponized you because you went in and found some of the really interesting stuff in there. But I think uh, they also weaponized me. So you know, you're not alone there. Uh, yeah, yeah, you mean like for the uh, NSA Swift uh, thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, de definitely. Uh, I mean, like, uh, just to elaborate on that, actually, F funny enough, uh, coincidence or not, you know, uh, I got a bunch of journalists from like Sputnik News and uh, RT were like reaching out for me, like, uh, from time to time for comments on uh, mm -hmm. stories. Uh, <laughs> and after a while, you know, I like at, uh, after one story, I was like, oh, no, I don't, I'm not really the, that interested to yeah. like, comment on this, you know. And uh, yeah. then, like, all of them stop at the same time. And uh, yeah. when I was supposed to go to uh, Russia last year uh, to uh, give a keynote at uh, Zero Night, I got uh, denied of entry at the border <laughs> because my Ooh. visa was quote unquote uh, invalid, but I had a visa with me. Uh, <laughs> so coincidence, you know, I mean, there are a bit of like uh, unrelated events or they're all related, but uh, regarding the, yeah, the weaponization yeah. of uh, things, uh, definitely. Although I still think like the document on the uh, NSA thing was pretty cool because retrospectively if you look back that's you know like all the thing related to double pulsar and everything were like used in that uh actual like release and that's yeah. what like gave birth to like when i cry and not petia and all those things so 
Yeah, you know, I, that's a fact. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the last chapter in my book is, a, is on shadow brokers. Um, and, um, and I think I'll cut right to the chase. We just don't know who was behind shadow brokers. It could yeah. have been an intelligence operation. It could also have been an insider, a, a form of insider uh, operation or leak or in, insider threat type situation. And, but the fact is that Russian actors took advantage of the, the, the story in, in public and private ways, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, especially like amplifying an existing narrative is usually uh, what works the best, you know, because uh, yeah. if you have to like orchestrate like something from A to Z, it's way too much work. So you're better off keeping your eyes open, especially if you have a fixed agenda. You know, you can have plenty of opportunities, like you said, with Snowden, like leaks became kind of like the cool thing to do. Uh, so you, yeah. they kind of knew like more would... Uh, uh, came up after. Although, like some people, like don't agree with the connection of saying, or like, or Snowden kind of like gave birth to like that generation of like uh, whistleblowers. Uh, but yeah. Uh, another question, just to like uh, move on to another topic, uh, is Netflix an active measure campaign? Um, Netflix. Yeah, yeah, I mean, probably not an active measure campaign, but I guess like one of the uh, topic that's coming in the chat is that uh, sometimes it does feel like uh, Netflix uh, has an agenda. So if you think about it, if you want to spread a message instead of, and uh, actually I was thinking of doing some research on it, uh, but it's very hard to like, just like uh, gather all the data is instead of like posting like tweets or Facebook posts or even YouTube videos, because obviously YouTube is used for disinformation. Uh, if you can get like your uh, documentary uh, or like TV show like validated by Netflix, because you know it comes up from like it looks legit, you know you have like an actual team, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, but then you can like kind of move the messaging around it, or even like have like uh, subtitles that are like erroneous uh, in certain languages. Uh, for instance, like there is a, a Mossad documentary. I remember I, I even tweeted about it. Uh, in one of the uh, English subtitles, you know, it was saying uh, death to Israel when they were talking about uh, Iran and how uh, evil Iran was. But then if you listen to the sound, it, like it said something about Allah. So I checked, I went on YouTube to find like that exact same uh, speech. And it was just basically so uh, something like uh, glory to Allah, you know. And in the English version, it was translated as death to Israel. And it was like more than a year ago, like almost two years ago. And from that moment, I was like, actually, like Netflix would be a great platform to like push a message because even if you look at um, even non-political subjects like veganism, all those things, like you, you get, like every time there is like a cooking show or something, like you have like ten people around you talking about it, you know, like uh, Tiger King, yeah. for instance, you know, like everyone yeah. is talking about it. It's probably like the most successful documentary, like. Uh, uh, about it, you know, whereas like if you push something on YouTube, you know, like, or even on Twitter, it's going to be a lot of work to get like, uh, your audience because it's going to, it exists more noise. Whereas like, if you can like, uh, you know, tailor it for like platform, like Amazon prime and Netflix, uh, yeah. is Netflix the radio free Europe of the 21st century? <laughs> well, I would, you know, this, the, I'll make a big, but I think absolutely crucial observation here. And that is, if we study disinformation operations, if you study active measures, active measures are actual conspiracies, small conspiratorial operations, sometimes longer conspiratorial projects, not conspiracy theories, but actual projects that have a conspiratorial purpose. Now, I'm using these weird terms here to make a big point. And the point is, if you start believing in those projects and start exaggerating their effect and their power, which is something that operators tended to do again and again, because it was good for their, uh, you know, get, got more money, got promotions, got uh, prizes and whatnot internally. Um, then you run the risk of becoming, becoming an actual conspiracy theorist. So what I mean by that yeah. is that basically disinformation should not be exaggerated because disinformation about disinformation is disinformation. Sorry to go all academic on you or, or you no, know. no, of course. Yeah. It's it's so what it means is if you study this for people like you know you and me really in, in some cases, 
it means we have to be extremely cautious and rigorous with the evidence and often question assumptions that we make um, uh, and, and, and be just uh, and, and come to the conclusion sometimes that probably the assumption that we just made is wrong. Um, yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Uh, well, uh, thanks. I guess uh, that, Thank that, you. that's it for now. Uh, there's some more... Uh, questions in the chat you know if you, if you have a look after i'm sure like uh, you I can will. see them uh, thank you so much but thanks again for joining us uh, it's a pleasure and uh, yeah if you didn't uh, get the book uh, you should get it uh, it's difficult to ship anything now but at least you can get it on uh, on kindle you know so it's always a, a good thing uh, to do um yeah so just a short uh, transition and uh, while we're getting ready for our next uh, speaker um, just a quick uh, reminder uh, for the audience uh, don't forget to subscribe on YouTube uh, I know it's kind of boring but at least you get like notifications you know uh, even though we give it like uh, well even though I'm doing that show like every like uh, two weeks uh it may switch to like a weekly schedule uh probably like in a month or two uh whenever like uh, it gets uh whenever it gets easier to do like uh all the live uh, streaming and stuff um so i hope you're enjoying uh everything so far and we're gonna get uh, ready for our next uh speaker and while we are getting uh, ready for the next uh, speaker, let me just uh, remind you that uh, we also have a Discord channel. Uh, feel free to join it. There is always like a bunch of things uh, going on over there. And let me just do this. And I think we are pretty much almost ready. Uh, can you hear me, Maddie? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> can you okay. hear me? Yeah, cool. Okay. I'm just going to launch the uh, transition and then uh, you, you can start. Cool. Cool. Активные мероприятия говорите. Будущее покажет. Добро пожаловать на виртуальный саммит Upcode. Okay, you're, you're on. Cool. Well, thanks for having me. It's exciting to have this sort of virtual platform. Um, but yeah, so a much lighter topic. <laughs> Nothing about disinformation and Russia. But I was also a student at Johns Hopkins and worked for them for a while. So maybe that's my ties to uh, Thomas. But this is instead that feeling when you get really excited, you patch diff to zero day used in the wild, but then find out it's the wrong vol. Um, so as I said, my name is Maddie Stone and I'm a security researcher on Google's Project Zero team. And I've been focusing on zero days used in the wild. So let's back up. And there's a story associated with this in the blog post that Matt alluded to before. Um, so as I said, I'm interested in zero days in the wild and a big aspect of zero days is towards windows. And I came and joined this team having plenty of reverse engineering experience, but no windows development, no windows vulnerability research, no windows reverse engineering. So when come December, 2019, when Microsoft Patch Tuesday said, hey, here's a new vulnerability that yes, has been seen actively exploited in the wild, I thought that would be a really great opportunity for me to dig in, get some experience, and share information with you know, our community about the vulnerability and do some variant analysis. So I get through it, I'm working, I'm patch diffing, I'm making progress, I create a crash proof of concept or POC, and we're so excited. I write up a blog post, it goes through our internal reviews, and 24 hours before our published date, we share with Microsoft as a heads up. About 10 minutes after it's shared, we get the email back. Maddie reversed the wrong bulb. You reversed CVE 2019-1433, not CVE 2019-1458. So this is the story of my process of going in, patch dipping this, what I learned from a process, and 
even though it didn't turn out to be the vulnerability I intended to reverse engineer, it still ended up being a pretty cool bug, I think. And I always learn from people talking about how they choose to write talks for vulns as well as how they find them. So hopefully it's of interest to you too. But backing up, I said I'm really interested in zero days that are exploited in the wild. If you know about Project Zero, you might know that our mission is make zero day hard. And usually for the last five years, that's taken the, um, we've done that through vulnerability research, trying to find bugs in consumer products and getting them patched, usually on the same targets that, you know, actors who want to exploit them are looking at. So when Ben brought me onto the team last July, my role was going to be taking a little bit of a different perspective um, of making zero day hard. I was going to instead combine vulnerability research um, expertise with sort of threat intel. Because every time a zero day that's been exploited in the wild is detected, that's the failure case for the actors behind it. They're not trying to get caught with their zero day exploits. So if we can use that expertise from Project Zero's team in exploit development, vulnerability research, to really analyze what the, how that exploit works, interesting details about the vulnerability, then maybe we can make zero day that much more harder by learning what our actors doing um, for real. So far, this has taken three different um, sort of prongs or <laughs> main approaches. One is root cause analysis. One of the things that I notice when you really look at a lot of things that are published about zero days right now is it often focus on like the exploit or the payload. Whereas I'm more interested and our team is more interested in what is the vulnerability and how did they exploit to get in in the first place. So we wanna do a root cause analysis to make sure there are all the details about that vulnerability where we can try to assess how do they find it. Was it through manual review? Was it through fuzzing? What type of techniques are they using? Um, and what, how are they exploiting it? What is their exploit methodology? Is it using known <laughs> exploit methodologies that we've seen for years? Or did they create a whole new novel way to exploit this? And then another important approach is after you have that root cause analysis, performing variant analysis on it. Because even on Project Zero, you know, when you usually find a bug, there's usually a couple more you find at the same time. It's usually not only discovering a single one. And if the actors that are using those bugs and exploiting them already have the full details about the vulnerability they're exploiting, then they off have a leg up on having those variants already that they can plug and play into their exploit. So we should be doing the same thing to try and burn as many of those bugs as we can to make it that much harder for them to redeploy their exploit. And lastly, all of this information can come together to help brainstorm come together and come up with new ways to detect zero days. Because obviously it's incredibly difficult. You don't know, um, because that's sort of the whole point of zero day <laughs> exploitation. But if we've analyzed what are their exploitation methodologies, how are they finding bugs? How are they using the bugs? Then maybe when that information is shared, we as a whole security community can come together with the differing tools we have, the different telemetry, you know, just different ideas and brains and the approach we bring to security to then find ways to make it that much more harder for people to be exploited. Because, you know, the whole thing about zero day exploits is they're usually used, you know, and they harm someone, they put someone at risk. And so we want to try and stop that. So that's why I care about this work and why I'm doing it. And I think this sort of example is also going to show why sharing um, is really our only path forward for all of this. Um, and it's part of the reason why I got it wrong in the first place. So let's go back to the second Tuesday of December 2019, Patch Tuesday. We open up the Microsoft Security Advisory, and there it is, CVE 2019-1458, a Win32K escalation of privilege with the notation, has it been exploited um, in the wild? Yes. So what are some details about this vulnerability? As I said, it's a Win32K <laughs> it's a Win32K escalation of privilege. And Win32K is one of the core components of the Windows kernel, the Windows operating system. And so on the same day as Patch Tuesday, 
day, um, Kaspersky, Anton Ivanov, and Alexei Kuliev published a blog post about this because they were the original discoverers of the exploit. And what we learned from their blog was that it is a part of a chain that was used with a Google Chrome Zero Day as well. It was obviously actively exploited in the wild. And one of the reasons why it was so interesting to me, and I thought this would be a great bug to dive into, is that it affected both um, Windows 7 as well as some versions of Windows 10. Last year, if we look at all of the Windows Zero Days that were detected as exploited in the wild, most of them were Windows 7. So I thought this one might be more, I could learn more from since it also affected some versions of Windows 10. And the blog post didn't provide a lot of full details about the vulnerability. There was some information about the exploit, but you really couldn't figure out exactly what the vulnerability was solely based on the blog post. But one of the key points stood out. The vulnerability itself is related to Windows switching functionality, for example, the one triggered using the alt tab key combination. So this is one of the main details I had to go off of when trying to create the um, root cause um, analysis for the vul. So let's get into it. But first, I need to think about how we're going to do it. So I personally don't have access to Windows source code, so that um, you know, that means no source co code auditing, no source code patch diffing. And I also couldn't find a copy of the exploit. I worked to reach out to people for a few, um, I think about a week and a half and never quite got it. So that left me with one option, binary patch diffing. Um, last fall, I did a presentation where I analyzed the some of the different binary diffing tools. Um, it was called like, what's up with WhatsApp? So if you're interested, with in my analysis of different um, bin diffing tools, go ahead and check that out. But based on that, what I found was bin diff um, partnered with Ida Pro um, worked best out of the box for me. And so I also decided based on guidance from James Forshaw, the Windows expert on our team, or one of them, um, he gave me the suggestion that I should work on patch dipping Windows 7 first rather than Windows 10. And once I understand the vulnerability, then I could move over to Windows 10. And his reason for this is that first, the signal to noise ratio is going to be much higher for Windows 7 rather than Windows 10 because the noise includes things like control flow guard, um, they have more inline instrumentation calls and weirder, <laughs> that was his word, weirder compiler settings that can just make it harder to reverse engineer in Windows 10. Also, in Windows 10, Win32K is broken up into a couple of different files rather than on Windows seven, the whole driver is a single file. So I got to it. I ended up patch diffing September 2019 versus December 2019. Looking back, this seems crazy, but the reason why I did this and what would it would ultimately lead to my downfall was that I thought maybe there weren't October and November patches for um, Windows 7. And the reason was is this is probably my first time using Windows in a decade. I'm setting up my VMs to begin doing this work and I need to apply all of the patches <laughs> to Windows 7. And when I finally get up to September 2019, the Windows update mechanism only gives me an option to update to December from there. There's no October or November. And so I thought maybe since Windows 7 is so close to end of life that maybe they just didn't have the monthly patches for October and November. And so I thought that the last available patch for Windows 7, Win32K, or Windows 7 in general, was September 2019. So that was why I ended up doing it um, from September to December instead of November to December. Oh, yeah. Oops, there it is. <laughs> So I load these two into um, IDA Pro, bin diffing, and there were 23 functions which had been modified between um, September and December. And this seemed like very promising because 23 functions, that's a small enough number that I could even go through every single one of them. The reason why there's no symbols for this screenshot is it took me actually about five to seven days until I realized that there was a thing called the you know, Microsoft Symbol Server where I could actually get symbols for this. So I had a couple of false starts thinking I had the correct vulnerability, the correct change, um, and then realizing it wasn't quite that. It's documented in the blog post if you're interested in seeing how this process came about. But ultimately I ended up 
deciding on a new approach, which was draw switch wind highlight is one of the functions that was discussed in Kaspersky's blog post. Draw switch wind highlight had no changes from September to December in the patches. There's no changes at all, meaning it wasn't patched to fix this vulnerability. So instead, I started working back up its control flow um, graph to see if any of the other functions within its control flow graph had been patched. And that's when I found that X window had. So once I got the symbol server up and running and integrated into IDA, the, you know, bin diff output became much more readable. And so the three functions that ended up being the vulnerability changes that I analyzed were XXX next window, destroy queue, and key event. And so there's obviously a few more steps in my patch dipping process, but this is a 30 minute talk. So if you're interested in the patch dipping whole process, please feel free to read the blog post. But let's now chat about what I analyzed, what I had thought was 1458, but turned out to be 1433, and get into the root cause analysis, because I still think it was pretty cool bug and I had a lot of fun doing it. So what is CVE 2019-1433? The first thing is that this function, XXX next window, can also only be triggered by a certain type of task switching window. You remember that was one of the details we knew about 1458 from the Kaspersky blog post. But what the root cause vulnerability for this one is, is the use after free of a tag cube object in this function. And the free is a, in a conventional way of common um, Windows bug classes in the kernel that we can see documentation for going back to like before 2010. So this object is freed during a user mode callback. Um, yeah. So what happens is the function key event calls next window and it calls it with a pointer to the tag queue object as the first argument. But the key event nor next window, never lock it to protect it during user mode callbacks. And the XXX in each of these function names mean that they have a user mode callback within the function. And so that's supposed to be sort of a signal that, hey, you should probably be locking your objects here. So what ends up happening is next window calls move switch wind highlight, which has the user mode callback. And once it returns, Next window uses the pointer to the tag cube object without any verification, and that's what causes our use after free. So super, um, super dense, but let's have some fun with it. So I have this idea. I think this is what the root cause is. How do we write a crash POC or proof of concept for it? So the three steps we got to do is we got to find a way to trigger XXX next window. Then we got to find a way to free the tag cube structure. And then we have to find, figure out how we can make sure we use that free structure. So first, triggering next window. When you usually try to trigger a task switch window in um, Windows, you might press Alt-Tab or Control-Alt-Tab um, if you want it to be sticky. That doesn't trigger a next window. The way to trigger it is this crazy, um, keystrokes that I figured out. Um, and I only figured out how to do it programmatically with these key codes. Keyboard in, but it, you know, if you're doing an exploit, you're not really trying to do it based on a keyboard, you're trying to do it programmatically anyways. So the combination is alt extended tab, release that tab, click alt regular, control tab, release all of them except the alt extended and click tab again, and that will then trigger your XXX next window call. So these are the two different task switch windows. The top one is probably the normal one you've seen on Windows 7, and that is what uh, it will not call next window, um, but it's what happens if you do alt tab control or just alt tab. The task switch window that is displayed when we can trigger next window with that crazy combination of keystrokes looks like the one below instead. So this is a highly condensed in order to fit on a slide example of the decomp decompiled code for next window. So here we see that the first argument in is our tag queue struct. And then we see here at the bottom, under label 106, we then use that struct. And that we can find a way within this infinite while loop starting up here 
that ends down here. And I had to, you know, do the dot, dot, dots. Um, and oh, I see the, the clicking noise <laughs> is my mechanical keyboard. Sorry, I just noticed a little chat on the YouTube thing. <laughs> but uh, so I shouldn't have looked. It caught it yeah, out of the corner of my eye. But so if we, oh, there's that L. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, y'all. Um, let's see if this helps. Uh, so we leave the while loop, um, and what can come directly to this place where we have the queue being dereferenced and used. And so this is where we do our user mode callback within move switch when to highlight, which is where we will end up deleting the tag queue. So to free the queue, as I said, we're going to do it within the user mode callback within move switch when highlight. And there are a few different options we have available within that function, but we need one which will reliably return to our POC code, meaning that when it sends a message to user mode, our piece or proof of concept can um, expect to receive it. And so that's how I decided to send message timeout within draw switch when the highlight. Because it is sending a message to whatever window is being highlighted in that pass switch window. So whichever one they're going to next draw that little blue square around as you're switching through the different tasks, that's who receives it. So if in our POC we create a bunch of windows, then they're going to have to send the message to us to highlight our window. So the message that's being sent is 8C or WMLPK draw switch wind. And this is one of the undocumented messages in the Windows kernel. So Windows doesn't expect user apps to respond to this message. Um, instead, they automatically dispatch um, a call to user32 function here um, to respond to it. So in order to make it so we can respond to it, we need to hot patch the kernel callback table. And so this is the code to doing this. And this was published actually um, by Jiru or Mateusz from our team back in 2010. Um, so this is the code that I used. So I looked up the entry in the kernel callback table and then overwrote it down here at the bottom with callback hook, which is one of the um, functions I put in my POC. So in our callback, we need to be able to free the tag queue. Oh, we need to be able to free the tag queue object. And so to do that, the best option I found was to use the API call attach thread input. Because attach thread input, what it says in the documentation is it attaches the input processing mechanism of one thread to that of another thread. And so to do that, it destroys the queue of the thread that's being attached to another's because it's just going to use the other ones. And so that's how we end up freeing our queue um, within our callback. The other step we need to do within our callback is we want to be able to force the execution back in that next window function to um, go to the code, the label 106, where they are using the free structure. So there was a few different things we had to do to in order to force that execution flow. So if this is where we are, when we return from our callback in our POC, then we need, to, we need to ensure that that handle of the next window to highlight that's being returned from move, move switch window highlight will return zero whenever it's passed to handle no secure. And so the window that's being passed, the handle, is whichever one is being um, highlighted. Um, and so to do that, we destroy our window because then HM validate handle no secure will return zero, which will force us to go back to the top of this while loop. Once we're back at the top of the while loop, then we need to make sure that we can fail one of these top um, checks at the top of the if statement, because we wanna get back to label 106 because that's where we have the use after free. So quite a few of these we can't control. We our FNID is always going to be 2A0 because of the type of it's a task switch window. And we can't change some of these other aspects too. However, the be destroyed flag 
tells us is set to one whenever the alt tab switch window has been destroyed. So that's what we do next is we can force ourselves into the else statement that's in the second box where we will set B45 equals to zero and then force us to jump down to label 106 if we destroy the task switch window within our callback. Um, oh, jump ahead. <laughs> so this is our callback, lots of code here um, where we cover the three different things we just talked about. So up here, we're freeing the tag queue object. Here, we're destroying the window that would be passed back through move switch wind highlight. And here, we're finding the alt tab or the task switcher window and then sending it the destroy message so that that be destroyed flag will equal one and allow us to um, jump down to where we use the tag queue struct. And lastly, once we make it to label 106, we dereference the pointer to the tag object and access um, one of the members of the queue. And so we can see in the instruction that is at that address, we are dereferencing the pointer to tag queue and getting one of its members. And then we go on to use R14. So that is how you write a crash block for the wrong bug that you were, <laughs> that I was trying to analyze. But I still thought it was a really interesting way to dive into Win32K internals and different ways of exploiting them and really sort of learning a lot about the previous research of Windows kernel exploitation and building those pieces together. So a few closing thoughts on that. One, it took me approximately three... Oh. <laughs> I, thought you, I thought you were waiting for questions. Just go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so there, it took me about three weeks to set up a test environment, diff the patches, and create a crash pop. Although I did patch diff the wrong bug than what I was attending, if we are a attacker or an actor who is looking to exploit one days or in days within Windows, then that's a pretty short timeline because you're not looking necessarily for a specific bug, but rather any bug that you can exploit. And since I had zero Windows knowledge um, to begin with, we can generally consider these three work weeks probably a high upper bound for the time it takes to patch diff and um, have a working POC for vulnerabilities and things. And I think that's an important thing for us to continue to discuss because there is a lot of vulnerability disclosure debate also that you need to let patches sit and to sort of have an uptake before you discuss what the vulnerabilities are that they're patching. But those who are looking to patch diff will have that information likely um, quicker than anyone else if we don't share that information. Another thought is we really do need to all work together to share as much information as we can whenever zero days um, that are exploited in the wild are discovered because we need to learn from them. We need to come up with detections. We need to find the variants. And we need to you know, think about different ways to detect future ones as well. And that can only come from us sharing the information and capitalizing on each other's strengths um, to really use those exploits um, as much as we can to raise the bar and require that much more investment from the, um, from the side of those who are looking to do the exploiting or the attacking. Lastly, if you're interested in getting involved in Windows, these are all of the resources I use that help teach me um, a, lot of the, a lot of the different pieces that I put together to do this, so highly recommend. Um, and lastly, what, what I do differently <laughs> if I didn't want to patch diff the wrong one is I would have used November 2019. So what I didn't realize is there's a, another Microsoft update server where sometimes you can find additional updates that won't be shown just by the Windows update mechanism. And there I found October and November, not just September. And so if you patched it November 2019 to December 2019, there's only five functions that were changed, um, not including 1433, which had been patched in October, not December. Um, if you want more about this, please go read Kaspersky's blog post on it. And they also, at SAS at Home last week, did a talk called Zero Day Exploits of Operation Wizard Opium, where they got into some of the details about 
this vulnerability. Also, Floric underscore PL on Twitter published the real root cause analysis for 1458, which is quite interesting as well. So I'd point you there. Um, I have a full blog post in the crash pock, as well as we at Project Zero are trying to track in the spreadsheet all the zero days we know of being um, exploited in the wild. And with that, thank you. Cool. Uh, thanks, Maddie. It was uh, it was very cool. Uh, the Win Thirty Two K talks are always uh, very interesting. I guess if uh, if uh, Dave Weston is watching, we can ask him when are they gonna uh, if they are planning to rewrite the driver in Rust or not. If it was just uh, <laughs> <laughs> because like it, like the amount of vulnerabilities in that driver has been uh, has been pretty crazy. I remember at some point when there like so many rest conditions, it was just like crazy. Like that's so, uh, so many of them. Uh, well, they, uh, and they, they've also done a lot of work to lock down exploitation of Windows 32K. Um, so yeah. that's why we're not seeing as many um, affecting Windows 10. And this one still only affected a few versions of Windows 10, um, not yeah. the most recent ones. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, actually, like null pointer uh, difference was a huge problem, actually, I remember, uh, for, for the driver. Uh, side question uh, before I jump onto the questions uh, from the chat. Uh, are you planning to look at the DirectX driver or is it on your to-do list since you started to look at uh, Win32K and uh, you know you got uh, your, your first introduction to Windows in, uh, in 10 years, if I, <laughs> if I quote you correctly? Uh, <laughs> it's not um, specifically on my to-do list right now because I'm sort of focusing any of my work based on zero days we find exploited in the wild. And so for 2020, there's already been quite a, quite a few, especially in browsers. Um, mm -hmm. So I've been looking at those as well and sort of just trying to follow um, and publish information. We're hoping to start publishing all of our root cause analysis for each of these zero days um, in the next month or two. Okay. Yeah, it was uh, an excellent uh, blog post, uh, by the way. Like, uh, I really like uh, how it was uh, written. Uh, so, question from uh, Dave Etel. Uh, let me retrieve it. Uh, uh, da -da -da. Oh, I just lost it. People have been talking too much. Uh, did you remove the question? Oh, yeah. Uh, how do we know the original uh, Verne Finder found that bug? Like uh, further versus manual analysis. Um, I so I don't for which bug the wrong bug or the correct <laughs> bug fourteen thirty three or fourteen fifty eight. Uh, a good question actually. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, actually, good question. So, like, by the time he replies, uh, he, he hears that. I guess we can yeah. uh, ask him uh, about it. Uh, also, um, he also so, asked how yeah. much harder is it to go all the way to a local privilege escalation? Um, I think you would be able to. I didn't. Um, I didn't do it. I think once you, the way the crash pock was working, uh, I don't. I think for someone who has more exploitation experience for Windows than me, I think the way they are using the use after free um, wouldn't be that difficult to take it to a local privilege escalation. But I did not go through the steps to do that. Okay, okay. Uh, he's saying, uh, he's he was talking about the wrong bug. Uh, did they not have that bug? Oh, the 14, so the 1433, the one that wasn't exploited in the wild. Um, I didn't check who actually had reported that to Microsoft, but I'm guessing it was, it feels like it could have either been a fuzzer, you know, with ASAN or something similar to that, um, just because of the crazy number of uh, keystrokes to even trigger next window. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, since it wasn't exploited in the wild too, it's not as sure and didn't, focus as much then on that piece of okay. it but i would guess likely a fuzzer and an address okay. sanitizer type of tool yeah because it's uh, i mentioned it only because that was one of the original motivations for these efforts yes. uh, question mark okay okay yeah 100 percent Okay, okay. And I think I saw like some comment about uh and I saw it in your references. 
uh, about Wizard Opium. Uh, is it an operation from Wizard Opium or is it unrelated to the bugs you are showing? So 1433 is not related to Wizard Opium, the bug I did a root cause analysis on because that was the mistake, the mistaken one that I thought was originally 1458, which um, Kaspersky said was um, exploited as a part of Operation Wizard Opium. So the intended bug I did not analyze um, has been associated with Operation Windows Wizard Opium. The one I actually analyzed has not been exploited in the wild or associated with any group. Okay, okay. And uh, another question, actually, uh, coming from a Linux uh, FreeBSD exploitation background, uh, what are good resources on jumping towards uh, the Windows side? Because I guess not everyone has uh, James Forshaw as a co-worker, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, so I, I would suggest reading the resources, um, and that would specifically be Windows 32K um, things. And I think my blog post talks also about how I set up my um, environment. So using WinDebug um, in Ida and using the symbol server. And so I also did a Twitter thread a few weeks ago about um, talks for um, that are, are at least seven or eight years old. And through that, there was a lot of really great um, Windows research um, and explanations that came up that I still think are extremely valuable if you want to get started into the research um, today. Yeah, because that must be, uh, well, I guess like most of it is quite similar in a way. I guess most of the difference was probably with the tooling, right? Um, it's not even as much the tooling as I think it's the, you don't see as many of those intros and the basics published today because I think a lot of people say, oh, it's already been done. Um, so going back to, you know, seven, 10 plus year old talks and um, presentations is where I found a lot of those basics of security research that then the talks that are coming out today made more sense to me because they were, you know, referencing or building on all this previous research but if I didn't go back and see that previous research, I wouldn't have really understood or be, been able to follow of how do I even get started. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, I don't think we have uh, more questions. Uh, well, thanks again uh, for accepting to speak. And uh, it, it's a pretty good presentation. And again, like... Uh, Congratulations on the blog post. Like uh, it's really well written. Like uh, you know, it's uh, I can tell there's a lot of work that went behind it. And uh, you know, every time I see like really nice uh, blog posts like that, it makes me happy. You know, because like pe sometimes people don't spend much effort in writing their blog posts. You know, and uh, when there is some good like uh, blog post that's uh, very enjoyable to read. You know. Um, Cool. Th and thank you all for having me. I'm sorry about whatever noise is going on. I'm <laughs> learning how to do this virtual thing. <laughs> That, that's all right but actually you know what like i was thinking uh maybe i will try it next time but there is like this uh rtx feature with the nvidia cards that uh, we can use to do like noise reduction uh because in theory in zoom like you have like a one layer of noise reduction but then the nvidia thing is like using the gpu so i will see if i can just do it automatically for like the guest uh but uh yeah, I guess probably like the, <laughs> I'm going to be using like more AI for like that uh, YouTube show than uh, for <laughs> like security tools, you know? <laughs> but yeah, cool. cool. Thanks again. Thank you. Активные мероприятия говорите. Будущее покажет. Добро пожаловать на виртуальный саммит Upcode. Uh, welcome back to our uh, show uh, or live stream, depending how you call it. Uh, the other day I was trying to search what was the difference between uh, a live stream and a virtual summit. And actually, uh, funny enough, like the <laughs> so I still don't know the answer. And uh, instead of that, what I found was uh, <laughs> like uh, like some uh, videos on YouTube about how people are like taking their online church uh, churches like online, uh, which is kind of like unexpected, you know. So and uh, even if you look at that, 
I think like the, the, the cool part about it is uh, when you watch the videos and even the production all those things they're doing, uh, they're way more advanced than uh, a lot of the actual like uh, security uh, security like uh, summits and all those webinars we see. So I thought it was uh, pr pretty funny. And uh, yeah, so I hope everything is uh, going okay. Uh, so again, uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to jump in, in the chat. Uh, same thing if you have recommendations uh, for later on, uh, do not hesitate at all. And on that, uh, the only thing I would have to say is, uh, yeah, so I hope everything is okay. Uh, same thing if you have like a recommendation for next time, uh, please do not hesitate, you know, for like theme or like if you want to recommend a speaker, if there's someone you really uh, would like to see, you know, uh, like there's people in the chat that keep asking for uh, Dave Vettel to come and give a keynote, but uh, is uh, our virtual, virtual guest, you know, every time. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's always good to see that uh, the, the, the chat is quite active and that we have, uh, you know, like quality attendees and uh, for, for quality uh, speakers. Uh, so our next uh, talk is going to be uh, not a talk, but an interview uh, by uh, Ryan. Uh, so Ryan Naran, who is also the host of uh, Security Conversation. Like I was saying at the very beginning, uh, his podcast is pretty good. He has interviewed, uh, uh, I mean, I don't say like all the security people, because every time he keeps finding more and more like security people to interview. Uh, I've been interviewed, like David Hill has been interviewed, like the last podcast is about the red team lead of uh, Walmart. Uh, from what I've seen, I was talking about potatoes and doing some analogy. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And for today, so uh, Ryan uh, is coming on the show to interview uh, Bill. And uh, Bill is a pretty good uh, security researcher. Uh, security researcher and I'm sure we're gonna see a lot of uh, publication from Bill in the next like five ten years so uh, it's pretty cool that uh, we have him uh, here to uh, talk about his uh, personal experience and have Ryan to uh, discuss uh, about it so I'm just gonna launch uh, the intro and uh, you guys uh, can start to uh, unmute yourself Будущее покажет. Добро пожаловать на виртуальный саммит Апколд. Thank you, thank you so much, Matt. Um, I'm so excited about this interview. You know, usually when I do these podcasts, uh, I have like a rich history of someone's uh, uh, career to look at and get prepped. Uh, for this conversation, I don't have that. Bill is an 18-year-old freshman in college. Who has already spoken at DEFCON, already spoken at Recon, and has a fascinating story about how he kind of nudged his way into security and nudged his way onto the stage. So I'm excited about this conversation. I hope you'll sit back and learn. And I hope Bill's uh, story can help act, uh, motivate some other kids, or if your parents help uh, some parents guide their kids into security research, getting into hacking and trying to figure their way through this. So Bill, thank you very much, very, very much for agreeing to do this. Uh, welcome. Can you spend a minute just uh, talking about yourself and pronouncing your last name for me? Yes, <laughs> uh, sure. So uh, as Ryan said, I'm a freshman in college. I'm currently studying uh, computing security at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, and I'm really into security, specifically Windows security. That's where a lot of my experience has been. Um, and I'm really excited uh, for, for a new talk I also have at Black Hat this summer, uh, talking about uh, demystifying Windows rootkits. Uh, so the pronunciation of my last name, uh, it's okay if you get it wrong, uh, but it is uh, Demir Kapı. Uh, it's, from, it's a Turkish origin. I'll get it right one day. Um, the whole last name thing I'm, I'm familiar with. No one can pronounce my last name, so it's all good. Uh, Bill, you kind of uh, uh, zipped over the lady there. You and I got introduced to each other. I put out a tweet recently saying, listen, I'm sitting around with a lot of time to do. There's no live sports. Uh, if, if there's some newcomers or some other folks who want to help with uh, submitting abstracts to Black Hat or any of the other virtual conferences, and you were the first person to reach out. And it was exciting to watch you write the abstract in real time, and then you just got accepted to Black Hat. So that's pretty exciting, except that this is not your first foray there. But before we get into what you're up to now, I want to go all the way back because your story is fascinating. When did you start like quote unquote hacking? 
and uh, uh, like your first foray into messing around on computers, not playing games, not just like, because everyone's doing that from the time they were a baby, but like actual uh, uh, messing around. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I, I guess I would say, um, of course, I, the first laptop I got was in um, in second grade. I was pretty young at the time. And I've, since then, I've been fascinated about the um, the Hollywood hacker, uh, just just the stereotype. Uh, you know, I watched The Matrix. It looked pretty cool. And I knew that's something I wanted to look into. Uh, but I did, really didn't start doing much until ninth grade when is when I decided, you know, I actually want to get into security. Uh, you know, it looks really Hold interesting. What is what is what age is ninth grade for a lot of the international folks listening and watching? Yeah. So I was probably around 14. Uh, okay. And so, yeah, it's still pretty young. Uh, but um, it, it was just when I, I, I wanted to uh, say, OK, I actually want to get into this, not just think about doing security. I, and I really started with uh, the website of things, uh, mostly, you know, cross eight scripting. That was the first thing I learned. And, um, uh, but it, it was pretty much web focused uh, for, for quite a while until uh, two years after 11th grade. And two years after 11th grade, uh, uh, you, you, you know, you and I talked before you got uh, your first like real uh, uh, research instincts from game cheating. And yeah, exactly. I'm a 50 year old man who doesn't play games. So I'm not a gaming guy. I understand the game. It's, it's really interesting because a lot of the older folks coming out of the 80s and the 90s breaking into cybersecurity came out of your same story. So tell that story about uh, uh, becoming a gamer and trying to figure out, uh, uh, you know, low level uh, security research. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I started with just in general gaming for a long time. You know, I used to play uh, RuneScape all up to, until maybe seventh grade, and and I was still into a lot of games uh, uh, before ninth grade as well. But in ninth grade is when I realized, hold up, I do not have money to keep paying for cheats. So I was like, guess I got to learn it myself. Um, so the story behind that is, you know, I, I started looking into uh, some of the forums out there that, uh, you know, where a lot of people came together and talked about cheating in video games. It was very difficult. Um, I remember one summer, uh, right after ninth grade, I, I spent the entire summer just trying to learn how to make these game cheats. And um, it was just a lot of asking. It was asking a lot of questions because at the time, my background, you know, I knew I took a high school C++ course. Uh, but, you know, for example, I didn't know that uh, adding two hexadecimal numbers backwards is the same thing as adding them forward because I didn't think of it as just a different base. You know, it, it seemed to me like a whole another concept. So it was going from scratch and I was trying to uh, make a cheat for a game with a very uh, competitive um, anti-cheat and one of the state-of-the-art anti-cheats that was running in like kernel level. Uh, so it was really going from scratch to being able to make something that bypassed uh, such a prevalent product in today's uh, gaming market. But uh, yeah, so the story there was, I just asked, I had a friend who was already very experienced with game hacking and, and I just asked him a lot of questions. And by a lot, I mean quite a few. Uh, just, you know, going back and forth, him trying to uh, explain basic even, basic concepts to me. And, and at the time, I, honestly, the, the final product of that summer was um, just duct taped together, you know, code from other places, but it worked. And uh, when I when it worked for the first time, that was like, you know, I guess you could say a thrill for me because um, it really made me want to continue the journey there as, you know, thinking that I could do it uh, over the summer. I remember I, I gave up several, several times uh, and it was mostly because um, it, it was just so difficult. Uh, you, it, it, dealing with low level memory is not an easy concept to understand, especially when it's the only experience I really had was um, from a. Uh, C++ course, one C++. Uh, but uh, I just kept working through that. And, you know, even after I gave up after a day, I'd, I'd go back to it. Um, and so from 10th grade on, I, I really just started to develop more and more of these skills that uh, into game hacking. And I started to actually, you know, write my own code and start, you know, start game hacking from scratch instead of just building off of what others were working on. But um, it, from this, I learned a lot of skills because it, to make a game hack, first of all, it's it's a lot of reverse engineering the game, right? Uh, so you have to figure out where our stuff uh, located inside the game's memory because those, that's the stuff you use to make game hacks. And uh, so that, that not only meant like opening up the game in IDA, uh, but like um, that also meant uh, actually, you know, dynamic reverse engineering, uh, trying to bypass the anti-cheat, which would protect, for example, you opening the memory of the, of the game process. 
Um, and so there was a lot of challenges involved in making my first game hack that I ended up learning a lot of different topics at once. Uh, so it was honestly, it was one of the most valuable experiences I've had is just game hacking teaches you so much. And, and if you think about it, it's like a gamified way of teaching because, uh, you know, you're playing a game. It's fun. Uh, and you also, on a, in addition to that, you know, have a thrill of, you can have a thrill that, you know, your game hack works so well, you know, you can just see everyone through walls that it, it's a very fun feeling. And, and it really, except for the moral you. part about cheating in the game and, and, and yeah, and of course, winning. well, yeah, <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> um, of course, of course. But um, uh, what I mean there is though, that it's really encouraging. Uh, so even after you want to give up at some point, the gamified fashion of the entire uh, just topic in general, how game hacking, it, it's really It really pushes you forward. Uh, it's fascinating because this is a, so you're in high school. There's something trips in your brain that okay, this game thing and this game hacking and game cheating uh, that you're you got invested in and interested in it for an economic reason to you know save money, and something tripped in your brain that oh my gosh, this is a skill that translates perfectly to security. When did that happen? And can you yes. explain to some of the kids watching like uh, not only when did it happen, but what was it? What yeah, was absolutely. That so um, the summer before my 11th grade, I, I realized I was looking at these skills and I was doing a lot of, you know, reverse engineering and binary exploitation and bypassing these kernel uh, drivers and writing my own kernel drivers even. And so at that point, I was like, uh, it sounds like I have a lot of experience that um, actually translate well to the InfoSec industry. Now, I wouldn't say it was like a perfect like, oh, this is perfectly applicable to InfoSec. It was more like this might be, uh, you know, I was still very, very uncertain. But I thought that I had the necessary skills that um, where I could really start a career in the infosec industry. And so what I decided to do was for the next summer, uh, I, I wanted to find an internship. Um, and so this this process was uh, very grueling. But essentially, my strategy was uh, to find any security conference I can go to and then try so wait, to network wait, wait. Tell, I want to I want to set up this story because I, I heard this story before. But I want to let me just yeah. put it on a mat for, for the audience. Right. So Bill is a high school kid. Uh, this this moment has happened where okay all this this game cheating stuff is starting uh, uh, start to match it to a, a potential career in security so now he thinks okay now I need to go to security conference and I need to build my network now Bill is a, a teenager in the Boston area so you're setting out looking for random security conferences on the internet to just go and build your network tell us what happens next. Yes. So, um, well, the first conference I went to wasn't actually a security conference because I thought, you know, even business conferences, um, that they're going to have the people that can, you know, maybe get me an internship that could be good to network with. So the first conference uh, I went to was called Business of Software. Uh, and there I actually met a lot of people. I didn't get an internship from it, but uh, I still like networked pretty well. Uh, and it was a lot of, you know, corporate executives uh, talking about uh, how to write software like, and specifically the management procedures around that. Uh, and, and, and the general strategy there was to get into these conferences that normally cost you $3,000 or something if for a ticket uh, was I'd simply email the organizer, say, you know, I'm, I'm a passionate uh, high school student uh, that's looking for, like, I guess, to network and, and to learn more. And the organizers were very well uh, received it pretty well. And, and they said, of course, we'd, we'll let you in for free. Uh, so it was pretty awesome. And and so the second conference I went to was called the Cambridge Cybersecurity Summit. And this was about more um, cybersecurity policy, especially with the public sector and how uh, the private sector can work with the public sector. But uh, so I, again, emailed the conference organizers there and they were very, uh, they received it pretty well. They said, absolutely, please come. Uh, and I, I remember the day I went there, it was, I was in wearing just like a winter jacket and some jeans. Uh, and, and I got in there. And I noticed, wait a minute, literally everyone else was wearing like a full formal suit. Uh, and then you saw me. Um, I even remember when I walked in, the security, uh, the security there uh, actually asked me, are, are you in the right place? Um, and I said, yeah, yes, I, I'm a participant here. Uh, and so uh, so I, I, got, I got into the conference and I was already networking. But then one of the speakers uh, was the general manager at IBM. Um, and right after he, he was giving a talk there and, and during an intermission, uh, right before we went back into the room, uh, I saw that there was this like split second where I could, where he was actually free to talk because I didn't want to, you know, interrupt his, his conversations with everyone else. Uh, and I just like basically ran up to him and I was like, I gave him an elevator pitch about, Hey, I'm a high school student and I'm really passionate for security. Uh, and, um, I'm looking for an internship this summer. Can you help me out? And at first he was, uh, very reluctant. Uh, you know, he didn't, he, 
he 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 was unsure about what to do next. And I I, I kind of said, you know, I, you know, is there a business card you can give me? Uh, and he wasn't the happiest about that. Uh, but he was like, you know, you cannot share this with anyone else. And I was like, of course, of course. Uh, and he gave me his business card. And so after the conference, I sent him my resume, which didn't have much on it. Uh, but when, when I sent him the resume, he caught he put me in contact with uh, uh, IBM Resilient, which is a uh, IR uh, platform for IBM. He put me in contact with them, and then I had an interview, and things went from there. And you got an internship at IBM from yes, just yes, forcing the next your summer. way from forcing <laughs> your way into a thousand dollar security conference for free, hanging out at the side of the stage and badgering the speaker. Not necessarily badgering, but making sure that you were seen and heard, and getting that business card. And the lesson here for the parents here and for the kids watching is. A lot of this stuff for you does not happen until you go get it. Like Bill's got to go get it, right? I mean, that's the mentality you had at that point. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's not something that, you know, I, I was really reluctant to even go to the conference, but I, I thought that the best way to get an internship like that, especially when I didn't have the formal backing, was through networking because the, then they, they would be able to tell uh, that I actually knew what I was doing. Uh, and then without that formal like degree, for example. Tell the people what you're up to now and how you got this one. Uh, yeah, so right now I'm, I'm, I'm interning for Zoom. And um, it's a really interesting story how I got that. It, it was pretty much just uh, one night, one, it was like 12 a.m. And I saw an article from a bleeping computer about how Zoom was um, parsing UNC pass as a URL in chat. I was, I was really confused. Why would, why would any sane person in Zoom want that to happen? Uh, and so what I did was I um, I popped open my Zoom instead of playing a game I could have, uh, and I and I just was curious. So I I reverse engineered Zoom's chat functionality, and I found out that they were using Microsoft's uh, Rich Edit platform uh, to uh, render these messages, and and that's how their messaging system worked. Uh, and so then then in that DLL, the MSFT Edit DLL, I popped it open in Ida, and I saw that there was a function that actually checked if it was a hyperlink, if a string was a hyperlink. And when I even when I just decompiled that function, I saw it immediately. There was a hard coded check by Microsoft to um, to that that if if a string starts with a backslash backslash, uh, and then any character but a backslash, it was a UNC path. Uh, and so this was really interesting to me because it wasn't something that like Zoom enabled. It was straight up just Microsoft's hard coded uh, stuff in that in that function. So I I just tweeted about, out about it just because it was something interesting I found. Uh, and then a few days later, uh, the CEO of Zoom, Eric Yuan, uh, he reached out to me and he said he was really impressed with, uh, with the re work I did there because um, he, he has a computer science background. And so to him, he understood the difficulty of, you know, re reversing that and actually finding the root cause of that bug. Um, and so when, when he saw that, he, he set a up a call for me. And then I, I asked him, you know, are you interested in having a security intern for the summer? And he said, absolutely. And so from there thing that now I'm working for Zoom. <laughs> That's awesome. So everyone start tweeting to Eric, could you want? Uh, there's like uh, amazing jobs. I, I'm just kidding, but shout out to Zoom, shout out to Eric and, and Katie Masuris and Alex Stamos and my homies at Bishop Fox and all the folks working on getting things right at Zoom. Uh, again, another example of Bill, you know, showing the initiative and making the effort to put his, you know, push his foot forward and use his research as his calling card and use his research as the, as, as the resume. So again, for the students listening, wherever in the world you are, you got to go get it. And a lot of it is just showcasing your work and then finding places and stuff uh, to do it. Behind you, there's a flag. What's the story with that flag? And tell me the story about your first uh, uh, DEF CON appearance last year. You spoke at DEF CON. How did you get in there? What, what was that like? Uh, yeah, so for it actually, the research thing, for example, it was um, my, my first, you could say, uh, subject of, I guess, penetration testing was really, um, was my school's grading system. Uh, and I and I started there, you know, I was like, okay, I, I know perfect target, something fun, because again, I wanted to gamify uh, the experience for myself. So I was like, who wouldn't want to hack uh, their own grading system? Uh, and so I, I started there, I, I just looked for basic web vulnerabilities. And I found I remember my first cross site scripting. Uh, but as I grew those skills, the, those web penetration testing skills, you know, I, I found a lot more vulnerabilities, you know, like um, uh, external XML entity inclusion or SQL injection. 
um, and being able to see, you know, the the, the plain text password of my peers, um, it, it, those sorts of things. It, as my skills grew, I, I kept improving by testing against my grading system and uh, actually, you know, learning more and more uh, by uh, actually using a real target there. Um, and so in 11th grade, that was actually uh, the first time I applied, I got denied. Uh, but I didn't let that discourage me because uh, the next year in my 12th grade, I did a lot more research that was um, on specifically Blackboard, which was the company that was uh, that we used school software from. And, um, and I found a lot more vulnerabilities and I made sure to improve my talk to the point where there was uh, a significant amount of vulnerabilities and uh, an amazing story behind it as well. Uh, because there was complications such as, um, you know, Blackboard, uh, the company that the, the school software company. I had to sign a contract with them, and then, but that whole experience with was an amazing story, and 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 I now had the technical backing uh, to, to support that story because DefCon isn't like oh you know war story plays. It's more about the, the nitty gritty stuff. Uh, and so then, in when I reapplied in twelfth grade, I got in, and yeah. So this flag is a speaker flag they gave me for speaking there this past summer. Uh, you're muted, by the way. Sorry, uh, that's awesome. Congratulations again on that. Quickly, uh, on the upcoming Black Hat Talk, what's the big lady and why should people come and listen to your talk? Yeah, absolutely. So the big thing about that talk is that uh, I'm going to be moving past just doing theory or just talking about different techniques that are possible to do. And uh, a large focus of the talk will be my own rootkit that I wrote. Uh, it's called Spectre, and how it works is that it will hijack the user mode network stack uh, so that you can communicate with the malware over legitimate ports. Uh, so, for example, if you have some Windows services listening on a uh, on port 1234, uh, the malware can be controlled by sending a specially crafted packet to that port, and then um, my, my hook in, in kernel will actually be able to intercept that and then read a command from that. Uh, but, but really, I wanted to, the, the talk I'll be giving, it, it's not just saying, here's stuff you can do, and this is a potential way of doing it, but it's actually applying that theory uh, in, in, in an example rootkit that, that I'll also be releasing with my talk. Thank you very much, Bill. Appreciate the time you come spent to tell your story here. Uh, best of luck with everything. Continue to hack the planet. Um, a, a big fan of yours. Uh, uh, I encourage all the kids to follow um, follow Bill's work on the on the screen right now. There's a there's a QR code above Bill's head. I believe Matt has set that up to point to uh, Bill's uh, website or his blog. I'm not sure or his GitHub. Uh, above my head is a QR code there that points to my podcast, securityconversations.com. Uh, head over there, subscribe, listen, help to share it. Bill, thank you again. Uh, Matt, thank you again for, for you know providing this opcode platform for uh, to showcase some of these things. So I appreciate it and thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you, guys. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to have you uh on, on the stream uh very interesting story i was uh a, a, every like uh every time you know it's always very interesting to know like how people get into like reverse engineering especially now because bug bounties you know like like web application security is way more trendy especially for, with the new generation and i remember like when uh i guess when it was your age now uh i i, I met like dino daizovi uh, with a pretty uh, well-known like uh, uh, Mac hacker, but also did some Windows stuff. And uh, even back then, when I was talking with him about it, he was like, "Oh yeah, well, when we started, uh, we all were running Windows 2000. So whenever we wanted to try something, you know, like the barrier of entry was not uh, as high. But like now, like the barrier of entry is even higher, uh, especially if you want to do like uh, you know, like operating system security and." Uh, that's uh that, that's pretty cool you know to see that uh, uh you know there's still like a, a whole new generation of people being interested in it and uh it's yeah, really like, yeah it's really fascinating because i you know you know i'd spend a lot of time talking to people about their careers and there's so many folks who are you know ctos and big 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 uh engineering uh leaders at big companies like microsoft and google who came out of game cheating who came out of this great game cracking world. So, I mean, this is the natural evolution of uh, what, what Bill is doing isn't unique uh, to kids these days. It's just a different, um, 
you know, different platforms and different. And I think Bill and these guys have it actually a lot easier because there's a lot more documentation about stuff and a lot easier YouTube videos and tutorials for everything. So uh, if you're a kid this, these days and you want to be a researcher and you want to be a hacker, there's no excuse for, for not self-learning. Uh, well, there, not that there's no excuse, but there's little excuse. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, you still need to put the work in it, you know, like, uh, <laughs> I don't think there is like yeah, more, more easier anything because there's more things to learn. So it, it's, uh, you can get in the noise like very quickly, uh, even like just reading. Uh, but yeah, co cool stuff, uh, Bill. Uh, let's check if the chat has any questions. So there is one person who has a question for you, Bill. Uh, did you join sure. RIT Sec? Uh, so CTF player was asking. Uh, yes, I, I think I actually, so RITSEC uh, is the security club at the Rochester Institute of Technology, and, and I, I am a uh, member there, and I, w I did play in the CTF as well. I think, I, I believe I got second place. Oh, that's pretty cool. Well, congratulations. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, 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 how big is uh, RITSEC? Uh, is it like a big group at the uh, university, or...? Yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty big. Uh, I wouldn't say that all security students at the university are part of it, but, um, uh, you know, there, there's a, a significant amount of people there. I'd say probably, I, I'm, I'm not, I'd be speculating, but it, I'd say that there's 50 or more active members, oh. if I had to estimate. I, I'm not sure, personally. Oh, that's pretty cool that the... Uh... I mean, I always find it fascinating, you know, when I hear like there's like security groups in universities, you know, it's pretty cool because I remember when like all the New York people like started the security group at NYU. Uh, so I think it was like Stephen Ridley, like uh, uh, Dino Daisovi, uh, Dr. Red, I think all those guys, they start, I think that they, I, I forgot who initially started it, but I was like, oh, wow, that's really cool. Uh, but it's, it's nice to hear that a lot of universities now uh, have, uh, have a lot of groups. That's pretty cool uh yeah it, does anyone have any question for bill or even uh even uh, ryan actually i'm surprised that uh Kostin and uh juan don't have any questions uh for you uh oh <laughs> i just <I> scrolled <laughs> i scrolled down i see a message from uh from uh, juan it's like where can i buy uh those cheats i need to uh beat the vettel at fortnite yeah, I mean, like, uh, can, can you tell us uh, slightly, uh, uh, just for people who have no idea, like, about the P2C, like, model, like, uh, how big is that market? Because the thing is, a lot of people in the industry are very familiar with, uh, you know, like, the exploit market, many for exploitation, you know, selling to governments or, like, uh, vulnerability brokers, but very few people are familiar with uh all the p2c like market works and all they would even leverage vulnerabilities yeah sure so the p2c market i've mostly work uh i, I what i've seen is it, the triple a games the ones with the state-of-the-art anti-cheats uh they it's quite a lucrative market because um uh, because of the high detection rate and because of how much is invested into the anti-cheats, uh, the cost of these cheats go up as well. And I, and I know that uh, there's a lot of cheats for those games uh, with the state of the ant art anti-cheats that can go with for $100 a month or more. I've seen some even like for private leagues go for $1,000 just to get into these um, uh, get get into these pay to sheets and so it, it's quite a lucrative market uh, for for the lower end games that might not have you know the high tier anti cheats um it, the idea there is that it, they sell them for cheap but um they do mass selling so that means they, they'll sell to a significant amount of people uh which will again make make the same amount of money um and so it, it the P p2c market is still alive and well um and it, it's quite lucrative as well as a because of the high entry to even make these cheats and keep them undetected, uh, people ch charge a lot for them. Would they use zero days uh, for P2C? So it means uh, pay to cheat, uh, if I didn't mention it before for the chat. Uh, sorry, what was the question? Uh, uh, have you ever seen like some private, like, or oh, like uh, pay to cheat? Uh, 
like uh, programs that were containing like zero days for like local privilege escalation, you know, like to load the driver and everything. Because, you know, even recently, I think it's Alex Unesco who was tweeting, how can we all agree that driver signing is a joke, you know, because he was pointing to a GitHub uh, that was just <laughs> showing that driver that was like signed and that like autos like features, you know. So uh, would you, because like, for instance, the Capcom driver, uh, actually comes from uh, a well-known like uh, cheater forum and then it was used in a lot of malwares so have you ever seen like p2c like uh, stuff using like zero days uh, for like local privilege escalation or stuff like this yeah so i wouldn't say for local privilege escalation the general idea is that uh you know customers that buy these pay to cheats they can run as admin i mean it's an assumption uh but for example zero days that i have seen a lot is uh, in invulnerable drivers such as Capcom, uh, for example, mm. being able to read uh, the memory of another process. There's a lot of drivers out there that require administrator, but that allow you to tamper with other processes. And, and I know that there's um, that cheaters do a lot of research into that uh, specifically, you know, how can we abuse these drivers that may require admin, uh, but that allow us to interfere with another process uh, and bypass the kernel driver of the anti-cheat. And so it, the most zero days I've seen is around that not local privilege escalation. Um, and um, it, 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 it's quite interesting as well because a lot of the vulnerable drivers I found were also during the course of trying to make, you know, a cheat because vulnerable drivers are really hard to, first of all, prevent because there's legitimate software using those vulnerable drivers. Um, and it's, it's difficult to detect because a lot of the times it, it can be a zero day. It's not public known. And, and a lot of these vendors won't even consider it a vulnerability because if you can read the memory of another process, but it requires admin for you to even talk to it, then it is that necessarily because Microsoft wouldn't consider that a vulnerability because, uh, you know, they don't consider ring three to ring zero, uh, sorry, administrator to ring zero, a security boundary, uh, because once you have admin, theoretically, you can do pretty much anything. Um, so it, it's not even technically a vulnerability in the first place. Uh, and but there are still a significant amount of drivers that are not known to be abused uh, by game hackers because um, that that allowed them to interface with you know games memory. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, I think some even uh, because there's like multiple types of anti cheats, right? Like you said, there is like the great ones that would be using uh, a driver and kind of like protect like the process of uh, the game. Uh, and funny enough, I don't think I've seen any game using like protected process, like the feature of Windows. And then I think there is like some games that recently like are just using uh, purely like user land, like anti cheats. Uh, yeah. Uh, so with that, the reason they don't use like PPL or anything like that is because uh, Microsoft has stringent requirements to even enable that. Uh, you know, if you can get PPL for anti malware. You know, if you're an antivirus or something, you can sign. You can get your uh, process actually protected by PPL. Uh, but for games, you know, the only way to do that would really be to, uh, you know, direct kernel object manipulation. You know, go into the e-process structure of that process and then uh, flip the PPL flag is to enable a protection. And, and and a lot of anti cheats won't do that. Uh, I haven't seen any anti cheat do that, uh, just because you know there's a lot of stability issues there. And now you're just it's not documented and um, it's, it, it could cause issues later down the line when you're process and when there's a process that shouldn't be protected by PPL, uh, actually protected. I see. And uh, I think like recently in the news, we have seen uh, Riot Gamp uh, doing like a bug bounty for like the anti-cheat driver. Is this like the actual first vendor to do that or is there is more vendors to do that? And, I, I, and uh, the the bug bounty program is only for like vulnerabilities. So it's not even for techniques for bypass or anything, right? Is there like any other vendors like approaching like researchers or not at all? Usually they're more paranoid. Um, so I, I have heard of uh, some vendors doing private bug bounty programs before Riot Games, but Riot Games has been pretty much the only one I've seen actually like go through with it. Uh, and actually for bypasses that, that by, like if you can get a DLL into uh, the game, I believe they do actually consider that a vulnerability in being the anti-cheat because uh, theoretically, you know, a kernel anti-cheat should be able to prevent user mode attacks. So if you have like a user mode way of getting into, into the game process, that is a, um, they would they would consider that a vulnerability as far uh, in my experience yeah that would make sense okay cool uh another question from the chat uh just to move on on the anti-cheat uh, topic uh from uh costin rio uh did you ask uh the school for permission before poking at the grading system is asking for permission important i think that asking for permission is important but uh ninth grader me didn't really ask for permission no 
uh, and that that was primarily because I didn't even like I didn't know about uh, some laws like the CFAA. And so uh, it, it, I definitely think that now I definitely ask for, for permission uh, for pen testing a target that isn't on like a local hosted thing. Uh, but um, I, yeah, at the time, I did not ask for permission. Uh, cool. Uh, well, I don't think we have uh, more questions. Uh, well, thank, uh, thanks again for your time, uh, Ryan and Bill. Uh, it was very, uh, very interesting. And uh, thanks again for sharing your story. And Ryan, thanks again for uh, interviewing uh, Bill. Um, so on this, we're just going to... Активные мероприятия, говорите. Будущее покажет. Добро пожаловать на виртуальный саммит UpCode. And uh, welcome back. So uh, now we have uh, one more uh, presentation. So for uh, our next speaker uh, with uh, Mohamed from uh, Trend Micro. So while he's getting ready, uh, I'm just going to remind you guys again to, well, guys and girls, uh, to subscribe on the channel. Uh, feel free to join the Discord. Uh, uh, server so we have a bunch of uh, discussion over there if you guys uh, remember initially we had an irc server well that didn't go like really well i mean it was okay we, we had like 10 people to it but like after like uh, not even like two weeks we had like 200 people on the discord um, server so i guess it's uh, it's an important not to uh, live with uh, with our time um uh, but yeah um And uh, so let me check. Da -da -da. Yeah, okay. Uh, so do you guys have any question, any feedback so far before we move to our next uh, uh, speaker? So, so we're gonna be uh, having Mohamed uh, to discuss about uh, Pure Basic. And just waiting for him to get ready. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me actually. Unmute. Oh, can you hear me now? Okay, cool. Uh, you can start uh, sh sharing your screen, I guess. And okay, cool, cool. And uh, yeah, we will uh, move on. Uh, to to the next uh, thing <laughs> we will the next subcode be animal farm uh, theme french transition etc uh good good question so you know he, he actually it's it's, it's quite uh, it's not a bad uh, comment actually Ron, uh, even though i'm sure you're trolling uh there's this tv show actually called the the bureau uh, that greg recommended to me like uh, i think one or two years ago uh which has some pretty decent uh I mean, it's probably not the official office, but of like uh, uh, like shots of the DGSC and everything. You know, there's like some theme, you know, like uh, uh, the Russians, etc. So that's pretty cool. Initially, I was thinking of like using that for like the transitions, and then I was like, well, I don't know if we would be able to use it because you know it comes from an actual uh, TV show and stuff. Uh, but yeah, definitely more than happy to uh, use. Uh, some cool stuff for the next transition uh, again if you have any uh, recommendation for the next uh, uh, up god which is gonna be like in two weeks uh, let me check for the date i think it's gonna be the 20th of uh, of may uh yeah uh, please uh, send them over and uh, yeah that's pretty much it so our next speaker is uh mohammed uh, mogbel Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that uh, properly um, from uh, Trend Micro. And um, yeah, so just launching the transition. Активные мероприятия, говорите. Будущее покажет. Добро пожаловать на виртуальный саммит. Awesome, great. So I'm Mohamed Mokdel. I work for Trend Micro. And today I'll be talking about my own exploratory endeavor in the reverse engineering of a multi-platform compiler, and in particular, pure basic compiler. Although I hope that uh, the talk is not like 
the 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 end message of the talk is not just specific to pure basic as much as about the uh, the actual process behind it that I went through to reverse engineer this compiler. And as you can tell from the title, it's an exploratory endeavor, meaning that uh, I have to go right, left to get what I want and to piece different things to make sense of what I'm trying to do. Just like when Columbus discovered uh, America. So there is no set path that you have to take to get what you want. So, uh, so this is the, uh, this, this, this is the process there. Uh, so yeah, uh, a bit about me. I know a lot of you don't know me. So I'm a senior security researcher at Red Micro. I'm a mem member of the Digital Vaccine Lab. And my interest lies in the areas of reverse engineering, malware, IDSs, intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems. Uh, I'm very fond of the C++ programming language and compilers and uh, a bit on the uh, software performance analysis side on different architectures. And I, I have a special interest in exotic communication protocols, especially protocols that don't fit particular uh, specifications. For introduction, uh, and the difference between a native programming language uh, versus uh, interpreted language. Uh, Side, if we're talking about things. really, uh, okay, uh, yeah, it is. All right, let me see. Yeah, sorry for that. Uh, we're trying to fix uh, the, the, the problem. Some research for like uh, Canada zoom information now. Okay, let's see if we get a call back now. Uh, okay, okay. So I, I didn't see you were quiet in the chat, so I was not sure uh, if you actually uh, uh, joined it. Uh, Russian police version Daft Punk is also good. I wish you uh, had given uh, it to me before. Actually, like, yeah, in the transition uh, video, the sound uh, being used uh, is some like techno remix of the uh, USSR anthem. I don't know if you can notice. I I'll switch back and forth to see if you can uh, detect it. Активные мероприятия говорите. Будущее покажет. Добро пожаловать на виртуальный саммит Upcode. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Ryan should have a permanent interviewer spot in uh, Opcode. Uh, I do agree. Like, uh, he's, a, he's a pretty good uh, interviewer and he has pretty good content also. So I think that's uh, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty fun. Uh, does the Discord chat shows up on the stream? It does show up. Uh, so there is a merge from like Twitch, Discord and uh, YouTube. And uh, so definitely. Um, I don't think you can connect from two endpoint. No, I think you do. You, do uh, you can connect on Zoom uh, with two endpoints. Uh, actually, it's quite common. Like for instance, like VoIP is bad in a lot of countries. Uh, let's say like in UAE, for instance. Uh, 
it is <laughs> it, it is banned so people have to call uh, who, who is the voice it's my uh, alter ego uh, doing the Russian voice uh, so I mean I, you know like uh, it's also always useful you know uh, it's Greg who taught me uh, how to speak Russian he's, he's a pretty good uh, pretty good Russian speaker you know and yeah, you can uh, unmute yourself, uh, Mohamed. Let's see if it does work. I'm gonna let's see. One, two, one, two. Can you hear me, uh, Mohamed? Should I unmute uh, your phone? Plot twist. You can unmute speakers on uh, <laughs> on Zoom. Oh, this is a uh, double echo. You, you have to put your uh, computer on mute uh, first. Okay, yeah, so uh, guys, uh, while we have some time now, who do you think we should be inviting uh, as a keynote speaker for the next uh, upcut? So it's in two weeks, and I still uh, didn't think of uh, anyone yet. Do you have any uh, recommendation? Uh, so that would be... Uh, it would be a uh, pretty good if you have any uh, recommendation for talks actually i think we, we are pretty good like uh, we may even have like a, a backlog uh, of talks but for keynote you know like is there like anyone in particular that you would be interested in hearing or you know let's say a specific topic that would be like uh, quite cool you know uh, the idea also is like to try to kind of keep like the scope like pretty broad uh, Who's, uh, I mean, I do love reverse engineering talks, you know, but I can understand that like, even within reverse engineering, there's like different branches. Uh, John, John McAfee. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I did ask uh, John McAfee. He redirected uh, me uh, to his uh, assistant, who is uh, his wife, right? And uh, she said uh, it does not appear on uh, live streams if there is less than 5,000 uh, subscribers. Uh, I personally do think it would be interesting. Uh, but then I, I, when I posted it on Twitter, I got some fire back of people saying, well, uh, do, uh, like, do not give a platform to that person due to all the allegations that are around him, uh, which to uh, a, a certain point i do agree but let's say if like barack obama or like any u.s president is speaking somewhere like no one is saying okay that guy is like uh, a murderer you know so uh, uh, it's a uh, give and take you know so it's a it's, it's a tricky one uh can you uh, hear me Mohamed? i can see you're connected with your phone but uh, you're on mute let me yes, unmute yourself. Oh, okay yes, okay can I, you I just Okay, yeah, it's perfect actually now. Uh, can you share your oh. screen again? Uh, sure, let me do that. Yeah, just mute your speakers and that's uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Upcode is going to run, turn into 24 hours of talks. I mean, to be honest, like once you have a, like uh, a, a live stream, like uh, if you start commenting like a news article and stuff, uh, definitely it's pretty easy. I think it's easier to stream on Twitch uh, for that. YouTube, it's probably better if you do like events and you organize it. But if you do like uh, some pop up, like uh, uh, streams, you know, like Twitch is a pretty good, uh, pretty good one. Uh, yeah, can you put yourself in uh, full screen? Oh yeah, For, sure. like your slides, yeah. All right. Okay. Are we back online? Yeah, you 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 can go. Okay, awesome. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm still trying to figure out how to do. Uh, teleconferencing. <laughs> All right. So back to this whole thing. Uh, I was, we left on um, uh, reversing uh, native programming languages versus interpreted languages and the difficulties between them. So when reversing a native programming language, you'd have to think about compilers, differences in the compilers, optimizations, libraries used, processes, phases, uh, different file format, uh, code generation, dependencies on any particular OS. Uh, so yeah. And for malware, Mostly, it is written in uh, native programming languages, in particular x86, whether it's a 32-bit or 64-bit. Then you have C++, Objective-C, or Delphi. 
And all of these, they inherit different runtime libraries that you have to think about when you're just engineering them. And you have to have a better understanding of how the compiler link each of these libraries, whether it's statically link or dynamically link. Now, uh, of part particular, we have the Go programming language. And if you remember at the time when it was introduced, uh, it wasn't that easy to reverse engineer, uh, although it is a native programming language and it has a lot of metadata uh, that it gets uh, pushed to the executable uh, just due to the nature of how uh, Go compiler works. Uh, but it was still very hard to reverse engineer until uh, Tim Strazari released his IDA plugin. And then this is followed by Juan Calve, who released a set of uh, Python plugins for the uh, Android decompiler. And this was actually pretty good work, very, very solid work. And, and, and the reason that works, why those plugins are able to uh, give us a lot of metadata uh, for Go binaries when you're engineering them is that it suggests that uh, some runtime information has to exist in the compiled binary for the program to run. Uh, so that's that for native versus uh, interpret languages. So this talk is not about interpret languages in any form or shape. It's about pure basic, which we'll delve into later on. Uh, so the top layout is first we'll introduce pure basic, the language, a bit of examples, actually it's just one example. And then we go into the compilers and libraries. And then the thesis of the talk is literally I mean, reversing proprietary file formats without doing any actual reversing, except in specific cases. And the talk is geared toward the uh, Windows version of the uh, compiler. And then we'll uh, do like uh, how it highlight uh, two case studies and uh, demo a parser that I wrote and the under the plugin that helps in reversing the uh, pure basic uh, uh, binaries. Uh, so, so we start. So pure basic. It produces native code for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux platform. Again, it's literally native code. You can look at it. It's not uh, uh, intermediate or any interpret language. Because if you uh, Google it and see people like talking about this particular topic, there's a little, a lot of misconception around in, like this particular area, which I don't know why. Uh, and then the, this. Uh, Language has an extensive library support, and you would be surprised how much it has to offer. From audio to gaming, to databases, to networking, to writing GUI uh, uh, software. And it's extremely easy and uh, uh, like very, very, very powerful at the same time. And so it's, it's, I think it's probably like one man uh, uh, type product. And it's a very high level language. If you've ever used uh, or written a program in Delphi, you will, you will feel at home with this language. And it has support for inline as assembly, surprisingly, for both 32 and 64-bit architecture. And if you've ever used uh, Microsoft Visual Studio, I mean, the 64-bit version of the compiler doesn't even allow you to uh, use uh, uh, inline assembly, whereas this, this unknown pure basic compiler allows you to do that. And for assembly, uh, it uses the FASM assemblers on Linux, Windows and Linux. Uh, and the ASM uh, on OS X. You can actually use pointers for memory access. It does uh, give you such low level access. And if you want to call into any of the shared native libraries on your preferred uh, OS, you can do so via these uh, helper functions called call function and call C function, depending on the calling convention. And some of the features of the, of the language itself is. Of course, you can use procedures, meaning functions, structures, interfaces. If you're, we're talking about C++ or Java, it's, it's just the classes with basic in, inheritance, just like one level inheritance. And in this language, they are known as extents, not inheritance, like not inherit or anything like that. Um, so yeah, so this is an introductory example about how you would write a program in this language. So if you want to define a structure, this is how you define it. So in this case, we have a structure named uh, COVID-19, and it has these six data members. And the way you define or give a type for a given data member is by uh, ending the name with a dot versus, uh, but, and followed by the, uh, by the type 
or just like one letter. In this case, name would have the type string, that the type bool, data infected type string, age type integer, and whatnot. If you want to have a data member with a type float, it would be dot f. And, and then we create a list of that type, a list named patients of type COVID-19. And if you want to add an element to that list, you would have to use the add element uh, API. Now, if we want to uh, populate these data members, this is how you do it. First, the name of the list, uh, open parentheses, followed by backslash, followed by the, uh, by the data member that you want to access, and then you give it the name. By the way, this is a fictional character. Uh, I just came up with, like, with this name, so don't just go about Googling and hoping that you would find the, this particular person. And if you uh, sort of like get tired of repeating the name of the, uh, of the element, I mean like patients, you can just use the, uh, this, is, this, this unique construct called with and end with. And so if you, give, if, if you say with patients, and then you can just reference the data members without, without having to uh, uh, type the, uh, 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 the list name every time you uh, populate a given data member. Uh, so after that, let's say we want to uh, pop up a message with some specific information from this data structure we use the message requester. But prior to that, let's say we have multiple elements in this list. You got to select a particular element uh, with the index. And say, in this case, we use the select element or the, the, uh, uh, the, the index, or I should say the element in that list that is zero in this case. So we only have one uh, element in it. And then in this case, we call message requester pointing, uh, uh, printing out uh, a dialog box with the uh, title, and, uh, and, and the body of the message and the, and the, and the constant at the end, uh, which is just an, an OK body. And if you want to clear the structure, use the clear structure API. And this is how, uh, like this is, uh, this dialog box just shows uh, what libraries in pure basic some of these functions reference. For example, clear structure is coming from a library known as memory and the element one pertaining to the list, uh, they are called, they are coming from a library called linked list. And for message requester, it is from the requester library. And since we are building this, let's say on Windows, so if you wanna bit, like, do a bit of deep dive into this, you will see that message requester at the end of the day calls message box Windows API. So after, after you run this, this is what you get. Just the typical data box on Windows. Now, now we're going to the compilation components of this particular compiler. So if you go like after installation and you go to the compiler directory, this is what you see. So first we have the phasm.exe executable. This is an open source flat assembler for X6 processors. It's an assembly engine. It's a very powerful and has a macro instruction language. And virtual most of you, I mean, whoever did uh, reversing or wrote any assembly, I must know how, how, how easy it is to use this assembler. And the compiler, every time you use it to uh, uh, like link the final object file, it always produces, like for whatever a program, it produces an, an object file under this particular name, purebasic.arch. And it is in call format, common object file format. Uh, so for, for, uh, for linking, the compiler uses polling, which again, another open source linker, for linking multiple object files that generated by this compiler. Uh, and then it comes with Polit, which is just a library manager, which is again an open source by Bill Orinos. Uh, and you can use it to build import libraries, extract object files, or delete, or list them, or whatnot. Actually, at some point in time, I didn't realize that this uh, executable exists, and I was planning to do it, like write this thing from scratch myself, but then hopefully I found it before. And then we have this another uh, open source from Pell Orinius uh, tool uh, called Resource Compiler, which is used, which is used for uh, creating resource file, but like resource file, they are used for uh, hosting the, uh, for example, DB element or any, any, any of these stuff. And comes the orchestrator, the master of all of these things, the PB compiler. Uh, so this is the main compiler. This is the actual component that actually emits the uh, FASM uh, assembly instructions. And it's always written under this particular file name, purebasic.asm. So these are fixed. 
so as stated, it is orchestrated that leads to the generation of the final executable. So as you can tell, the guy is actually quite smart. He didn't have to implement any of the back-end components of the compiler as much as just the, uh, the front-end, uh, as we'll see later on in the, in the, in the uh, next uh, uh, slide. So this is a very smart, form, uh, smart move on the, uh, on the author of this uh, compiler. It makes his life very easy uh, by leveraging other people's work and uh, focusing only on the front end sort of component, front end slash next end, which is called like intermediate type end. So if we do follow like uh, uh, the process of compilation of this uh, compiler, it goes like this. So let's say we have this example and the extension for the, the, the file is .pb. So, and all it does is it just uses the message request API with the title hello, the text word, and it uses the constant message request OK. So this is the pure basic uh, source code presentation unit that you feed into the compiler, PB compiler, DXE, which does the lexical analysis, syntax analysis, and the code generation. So this compiler leads to the uh, generation of the actual PASM assembly code under the name pure basic with ASM. And here in this uh, uh, extremely and heavily truncated uh, assembly snippet, you can see uh, the nature of the generated assembly code. And it's very readable. Uh, and I, like here, I'm omitting the prologue uh, of this uh, assembly snippet. But you can test it yourself and you see the whole code. And then, uh, you use PASM to uh, generate the object file, and then you want to link the object file to generate the final .exe file. The compiler would use the fork of polling uh, executables. So this is the whole process of how the compiler goes about generating an actual executable file. The process would be extremely, uh, not extremely, it should be very similar on uh, Windows and Linux, but just that use a different uh, uh, assembler. Uh, Moving forward, so this is like a more of a dynamic example of how the compiler would, uh, like at the, at, the, at the command line, how it would sort of like uh, piece all these uh, 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 commands together for generating the final executable by calling the polling executable and giving it all these parameters that are, or at least I hope they are sort of explanatory. So I won't go in depth uh, into, into each one of them. Now the libraries, which is the crust of this talk, because they are uh, stored in a proprietary file format, and they are different from Windows versus Windows uh, versus uh, Linux and Mac OS. So on on uh, on Windows, they are stored uh, 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 zlib compressed with a particular uh, header. Uh, so that the compiler can uh, uh, use them whichever way they want. Whereas on Linux and macOS, they are stored encrypted. Now, why? Of course, there is a reason for that. Actually, the, the author of the, of the compiler doesn't want you to have access to these libraries that have all this rich functionality that you can uh, use with your own program but because they have all the export APIs for you that you can just call and to perform whatever uh, function you want. Uh, so the compiler is shipped with different types of libraries. So if you go under the compiler's directory, you will see that you have this set of uh, libraries. Like for example, debugger, if you want to debug your program, so this library would be referenced. If you want to use a database uh, type code, then you see the libmaria db and the list goes on. And now we have the list of pure libraries. So under this directory, we have around 116 uh, library, and this is the like uh, this is where all of the functionality of the compiler resides. It's in this particular uh, folder. If you want to send an email and you're calling any of the functions of this library, it is in a library under the file name mail. And if you want to write an FTP client, it's under a library called FTP, and the list goes on. Uh, and by the way, just so you know, uh, all of this work uh, is specific to version 5.71 of the of your basic compiler. Like this is like this is at the time when I started uh, working on it. Now I think they have uh, 5.72. Uh, 
but nothing major has changed. It's still a minor uh, release. Uh, and now if you go to, uh, like if you are in Windows, so you have this directory, if your libraries, Windows libraries, where you have uh, some of the Windows uh, proxy uh, libraries. And if you want to write your own library, this is where it resides, it's under this particular directory. Uh, the, the compiler comes with its own SDK where you can write your own uh, library and use it in your code. Now, this is this is actually quite an interesting uh, design decision from the author perspective, and, and, and I found it quite good, actually. So it has these two different subsystems. So for example, when you want to write uh, like OpenGL or DirectX 11 uh, code, you don't need to use specific APIs for each of these libraries. If you just you have a higher level uh, API uh, that would call into each of these libraries, and the way to uh, decide on which subsystem to use is at the time of compilation, you just reference a specific subsystem, which is a very good uh, design decision when writing compiler or any or software engineering any particular software. Now on, on Linux, you have a GTK2 and a Qt. Uh, yes, and then another interesting design decision is what's known as residence. And, 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 and these are pre-compiled binary files, and they are used for storing like uh, predefined structures, constants, interfaces, and macros. And this is, again, a very good decision uh, because it makes it easier to load all of these at once, uh, even like before compilation, just at the time when you run the compiler. So usually like on uh, when you see C++, uh, you would have to include the header file, right? And you know the the, the struggle when you have to uh, deal with this, when you have multiple object files and you have to deal with all the different uh, references and so you end up with collisions and multiple inclusions. So, so this is a very good uh, design decision. And if you choose to write your own resident files, the compiler actually comes with, uh, with this functionality via the uh, option to read resident. Or if you want to uh, peek into some of these resident files, the compiler IDE comes with uh, a built-in structure, a viewer GUI tool. So you don't have to write your own tool. At one point in time, I decided I wanted to write my own tool until I stumbled on this uh, already written tool by the author. I know now you might be wondering, so why all of this? What is the purpose of this talk? I hope you already read the abstract and, 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 this, and things become uh, clear. So, so this the, of the, the, uh, the goal of all of this is that when you, uh, when you want to reverse engineer uh, a binary, a native binary, uh, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning on the difference between native and intermediate languages is that uh, for native, you're gonna have to account for all the runtime libraries, whether they are static link or dynamic link. So when you reverse engineering them with your favorite tool, be it IDA or Giga or any other tool, uh, it's easier if you have, uh, uh, for example, a Flirt database in IDA, Flirt signature, that would auto annotate these already known uh, functions for you, right? So in, for example, for Visual Studio, for Delphi already IDA comes shipped with these uh, uh, Flirt signatures, thus you don't notice it. So for this particular compiler, this is what it's trying to do, is to get a hold of these particular libraries and generate our own third signatures for either so that uh, reverse engineering pure basic compilers come easier. However, these libraries, they are, as, as I mentioned, they are stored in a proprietary file format and, and for other platforms, they are stored encrypted. So there are different ways of approaching uh, the acquisition of these libraries. Some of them is easy, but requires more manual work. The other one is more automated, and well, hopefully it is the right way, which what this whole talk is about. Uh, to start with this, so when compiling a PP program, the compiler actually, depending on what APIs you're calling, that references a particular library from the pure uh, libraries directory, it actually extracts both libraries from their proprietary file format and save them 
in the uh, user temporary directory under this particular folder name, pure basic followed by a tick, uh, get the count uh, decimal value. So this folder always gets uh, created uh, and, and all the required libraries for the program you're compiling are written in the, inside this folder in their, uh, in their plain format. So you don't need to do any reversing or anything. And, uh, and, and, and it has this format uh, that is .lib. Uh, and then uh, if you want to uh, get access to the actual object file that it creates, also, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's always created under the name purebasic.obj. And the rest of the stuff, the source file, the, uh, the resident file, or the manifest file, they're all under the same directory. However, and this is the, uh, the point that you have to keep in mind, these files, uh, they are written dynamically. And then they get, they get deleted right after compilation is finished. So you don't have access to them. Uh, so at, at, the, at the beginning, I didn't know that. It's only because I was poking with this thing. Uh, and then uh, I said, okay, let me run uh, uh, Procmon from System Channels Utility and see what's happening uh, on the system during the uh, compilation process. And this is how I got to know that the program writes these libraries into this particular folder in their original format. Uh, so there are a couple of ways of how you would approach uh, this to get access to all of these libraries in their original format. Uh, one way would be to pass the actual PB compiler and uh, try to find the, uh, the code that is responsible for uh, dumping these libraries to this directory and then uh, nopping out uh, the code that's responsible for deleting them right after compilation or whatnot. So I did that. That was cool. But again, to trigger all the libraries, I would have to use uh, all the code necessary that would call into every single one of these libraries. And I would have to repeat this for every release of the compiler on every platform. So this is definitely a non-sustainable solution. Thus, why I automated the whole process in a, in a static, a more rigorous way. Uh, so yeah. Now we come into the crust of the talk, that is uh, reversing pure basic libraries, proprietary file format, without actually doing reversing. Only one necessary. So, as I mentioned, these uh, libraries, they are stored in a, a unique way. And we will start, I know this, uh, this slide is a bit overwhelming, but we will go through it step by step, starting with uh, number one here on, the, on my left side. Uh, at the top, you will see this uh, hexadecimal snippet. So I'm only uh, accounting for these bytes. However, when you reverse engineer uh, binary formats, you have to account for the entirety of the file that you're looking at, not just the, the first 10 or 20 bytes. Uh, and then this is part of the uh, lessons learned at the end of the uh, talk. So how, like, how, how the, what I want you to get out of this is that you should learn a bit about how I approach it as much as, uh, oh, so this means that, or this means this. Otherwise, you won't get the full picture of this research. So first we see, I, like after opening it in, in a hex editor, uh, in this case, I use 010 editor, my favorite hex editor. So you'll see this particular asset string that's streaming out at you, and it is called Europe, right? So this is stored in Little Indian, if you reverse it, it's pure. I'm already dealing with the pure basic compiler. So this gives me an indication that this is a magic value. So th that's how I start by creating my own uh, high level structure. So in this case, number one, I named this header uh, pblib. Okay, so this is the uh, library header. And then followed by this double word value. In this particular example, we're talking about a library named alpha image. It could be another library. It's just for illustration purposes. So the next double word value, is uh, what I call is the index into the library data. Like this is where the actual full library is stored, zlib compressed or not compressed. Okay, and this index, you're gonna have to start reversing it, starting an offset GOC. So you might ask, how did you figure that out without actually performing any reverse engineering? Again, I said this is an exploratory endeavor, meaning that uh, I tried this, I tried that, until things start to make sense to me. Uh, 
so yeah, it's literally sort of like uh, use the divide and concur type approach uh, until things start to make sense to you. Uh, and then followed by the next double word value starting on offset GOA. So what is this? Oh, it's an ASCII value. It's four bill starting with Indian, which indicates the library version. So after doing like a string uh, dump of the compiler, you get to see that, oh, it has actually two library versions, three or four. And then followed by this another double word value in, in blue. Uh, and this actually takes either of the values, zero or one. And this indicates that if it is zero, this means that the library is actually stored non zlib decompressed. If it is one, it is stored zlib decompressed. Uh, so, but how do I know that it is uh, uh, zlib compressed if I didn't do any reversing? You will see later on uh, how. Uh, and then followed by this double word value at offset uh, 10. Uh, and this offset, uh, holds the size of the stored library of the actual real library in this uh, proprietary file format. Uh, so yeah, so this is the size of the library decompressed uh, as shown here in this data number. And then after that, we have the, uh, here to state it clearly, it's an alpha image string. In this case, this is the actual original file name of the library we're dealing with. So you could, so you could technically speaking, you could have the library named under, uh, like the proprietary file uh, library under. So, so, so the first, uh, let's say, twenty by twenty, you know, the first uh, thirty one, uh, thirty one bytes, are represented in this number one uh, structure, pd underscore lib. So, how would you know that this is the end of the file name? Well, you have the null terminating character since we're dealing with a string. And then followed by, num now we start with a uh, number two uh, structure. Now here where it gets a bit messy, but I hope I uh, will be able to explain it very clearly. Uh, this is what I, go, what I call library types, uh, based on my investigation by looking at most of the uh, libraries shipped with this compiler. It turns out we have two uh, library types. I think this is what I call them. They need to not be called this way. Uh, so, Started where we left it from at offset uh, 32 decimal, we have this value 01. Turns out to be it's fixed and it's always 01 for all the libraries. Okay, fine. So we won't have to do anything with this one. Now, what follows is what, like what I call a sort of like a dynamic interpretation for deciding whether you're dealing with uh, a library of type 1 or a library of type 2. If the byte at offset 20 hex is zero, then the next byte has to be two. And this means we are dealing with uh, a library of type one. How, on the other hand, if the next byte is not zero, then the constant byte, the next byte is not set. It did not be two, meaning we're dealing with uh, library of type two. Now you will see later on what type one is and what type two is, the difference between them. So as, a, as I mentioned, if the offset at offset 20 hex is zero, it has to be followed by the lip type constant that I remember that is always two. Now I have like in this particular structure, and this is literally how I have it hard coded in the, uh, in the code in my parser, uh, I have these what I call shadow members because they are not part of the actual structure to just that help me in, 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 in parsing, deciding on what library type I'm dealing with. So now we move into uh, structure number three, which details uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the data members of type one library. So in this particular case, like this alpha image library, we're actually dealing with uh, type one library. So take this as a perfect example for illustrating this particular uh, uh, library. So for, so what should follow after two, so remember if type one, two is constant, is the actual class name. And in this case, it is image. And then followed by number of referenced internal libraries. 
Uh, so in, in, in this case, we have zero one. This is the number of reference uh, internal libraries. So we only have one library. In this case, it's named image. What this means is that this library, this main library, alpha image, it's referencing the class image from a library under this name, image. So, you should, so if you go into the uh, directory uh, pure libraries, you should find another library under the name image that exposes the class image. Uh, so how, how, how did I name them and, and make like, sense of them? And, and then this way, it's just like by poking around and reading through the documentation and making sense out of it until uh, the picture is clear. And now we go into a uh, type two library. Uh, it's not much difference from type one, except that uh, in type two library, uh, the library might be uh, referencing what I call uh, 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 system libraries. By system, I mean, uh, like if you're using a pure basic Windows version, as you call in previous slides is, if you go into the Windows directory, you will see references to uh, Windows libraries that the compiler calls into when compiling uh, on Windows. So this here clearly say that if such uh, system libraries are referenced, uh, so they are in the header with their names. So if, if you're referencing, if this library references, let's say, uh, something from adds API phase two, you will see the name of the library here. And the rest is the same as uh, type one. Now, why the author makes such differentiation between the two, I'm not sure exactly, or why would he need to do that? But I didn't go into do, uh, that much in depth of this as it is irrelevant to my investigation. So that is that uh, for this, uh, for these couple of uh, bytes. Uh, all right, so as I mentioned, those libraries, they are stored uh, zlib compressed, either yes or no on Windows, whereas on Mac OS, uh, they are stored uh, 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 encrypted and they are not compressed at all in any form of shape. So how would I differentiate between the two when parsing them that I'm dealing with uh, a Windows or uh, uh, Linux or and an, an Mac OS library. It turns out that the differences between the two headers is that the author uh, sets in reverse order uh, this data member, like instead of storing the uh, decompressed size of the library, he sets it to the library version. So I do this exact check and see if this uh, if this matches. This means I'm dealing with a, a Mac OS or Linux uh, library and not Windows library. Uh, initially, when I wrote the parser before figuring this out, I just let it to the user to decide, but it turns out that is a way, uh, like an easier way to do it uh, automatically on behalf of the user. Uh, now we go into an uh, interesting uh, uh, set of bytes as well. It turns out that the author also stores in this proprietary file format uh, what I call a uh, function declaration for all uh, function slash APIs that this particular library exposes. Why? Again, I don't, I don't know why, because you could just reach out to the uh, documentation, which has extensive uh, like help for a given API, but he has been stored with some additional metadata. And there is a structure uh, specific to this uh, to this list of functions. So starting from where we left off, we see here we start with this uh, end alpha image. Uh, so this would be, remember, this is the function declaration now. So first, this is the API name. By the way, there is no member, which, which is interesting. I don't know why they also decided to do that. Makes it even harder to parse. There is no like double word value that would, would indicate the number of function declarations that follows. So you have to, uh, do it on your own while parsing this, and, like, meaning accounting for it uh, the, the, the proper way. So, and alpha image is an API name referenced in this uh, alpha image library. 
But again, it's still terminated. This, this is how I know it is the end of the API name. And then we have this byte in uh, uh, in blue, which should hold the number of arguments that this particular API takes. In this case, it takes zero arguments. So what, what should follow is what's known as the argument list. And this list will uh, hold the size of each of the arguments that this API takes. But in this case, this data member doesn't exist because this API doesn't take any arguments. Of course, it did not be the case just for this particular example that I'm illustrating. Uh, so what follows after that is what I, what I call API uh, type. And in this case, like it's a, it's a double word value and it is uh, highlighted here in uh, green. And this actually changes for every API, for every library. And to be honest with you, I have no clue what it means. And it doesn't change anything from reversing perspective. Uh, um, it must have been used like for tracking purposes by the author. I just don't know why. And then what follows after this is uh, an actual documentation, actually, like a full string uh, documenting what this API uh, does. But in this case, as you can see, we have zero. Uh, so it means this particular API comes with no documentation. And, and, and yeah, this, and you keep looping until you finish parsing the entire function declaration list. And they are, sort, they are stored in this very specific uh, uh, structure uh, format. So done with the function declaration part, then we move into part two on the right. And this is the most important part, actually. This is the part that stores the, uh, or I should say, uh, that gives us uh, all the information needed to uh, pull the uh, actual library in its plain format that we would use to generate uh, IDA search signatures. And it has the following structure. Uh, so uh, as you ask, the, the, the bytes in orange, you can see here, there's another header. Uh, sorry, there's another magic value. It's pure. It's, uh, it's stored in, in, in Little Indian. And then what follows is we have this another uh, double word value, which stores uh, the actual size of the library file as stored in the proprietary uh, library. And then what follows after that is the type of the library that's stored. It is, is it a data uh, library or a debug library? So it takes either of these values, that one or debug one. Again, all most of the data is stored in uh, Little Engine. And what follows is the actual uh, library content. And in this case here, you see it is starting with 7, 8, 9, C. And this is actually how I tell that I'm dealing with a ZLIT compressed data, because this is the header of ZLIT compressed data. So you can simply actually uh, just take the rest of the data all the way starting from this offset until the end of the library or, or until the end of the file and ZLIT decompressed on your own should you choose to, without having to do all the rest of the parsing, but that wouldn't be <laughs> an actual endeavor, I should say. Uh, that would be just shared picking stuff. So if you recall, I mentioned that on uh, Mac OS, uh, um, those libraries are stored encrypted and not uh, compressed. And this is actually pretty much the only time when I had to do, uh, other than patching the uh, PD compiler, where, where I had to do a, a bit of reversing just to figure out the decryption algorithm so that I can implement it in my parser. And the decryption algorithm is actually quite simple, extremely simple, actually. Uh, and, and it has this key of double word value, which is constant for all versions that I, were, that I was able to gather and look into. And for decryption, it's just simple. It's just take a double word value at a time and you uh, subtract it from the key and then on every, on every iteration, you add the file size, uh, meaning the data member here, the length, uh, to, the, to the key, and you keep repeating, and you get the decrypted uh, stored uh, library. It is as simple as that. Now, OK, so we're done with the. Uh, parsing of the proprietary uh, library file format and extracting the actual library we're interested in. Now we come to what's known as a resident file. 
as I mentioned, these resident files, do not confuse them with uh, resource files. These are specific to Pure Basic. They have this structure. So as I mentioned, these resident files, they contain um, macros, uh, interfaces, meaning classes, uh, constant values, or, or whatnot. They are stored in uh, binary format, and they, have, and, and, and they follow this uh, structure. Uh, I didn't find a need to uh, add this feature to, to my parser, uh, but I'm just uh, sitting here in this slide just for uh, reference purpose should anyone else decide to parse these by themselves. And you might be wondering, like, how did I uh, figure out that, uh, for example, let me say, that, uh, for example, here, prot, I have this, uh, this unique marker called prod. Like, how do I know that this implies that, what, that the payload that follows this uh, marker is, this is where the interfaces are stored because you didn't do any, any, any reversing. It's just a matter of looking at this stuff and making sense out of it. Like, what is the name of this? And then go check the help file and then and, and look at it like this. You, you literally don't have to do any uh, actual uh, reversing. Now, so this is just like uh, uh, some general notes from this uh, experience uh, on uh, what you should consider while reverse engineering proprietary file format without doing any actual reverse engineering. And I believe I've, I've already stated most of this stuff, but just to reiterate. Whatever uh, framework you're, you're reversing, you got to familiarize yourself with it. Ir irrespective of how complex it is or what technology it is using, you're going to have to read into it uh, and read documentations, poke in every directory, and execute this, execute that. And whenever you're in doubt, just Google it and see if somebody else uh, answered some of your uh, peculiar questions that you can't answer yourself. And of course, the most, most important part in all of this is a hex editor, whatever hex editor you use. And experience does indeed play a major role when uh, like trying to uh, reverse engineer such stuff without actually doing any reverse engineering, because it helps you in identifying certain patterns and uh, specific constructs that you, either, that you otherwise wouldn't be able to uh, do easily. You can, but not easily. You would have to. Uh, get a gray hair until you get it right. Uh, so just to uh, make this note clear, uh, reversing binary format is definitely uh, different and more difficult, uh, not only uh, from reversing perspective, even from parsing perspective, especially when you're dealing with uh, dynamic data, with data that you know the size of it, it makes parsing really, really hard compared to reversing text-based format such as uh, HTTP protocol, although parsing HTTP is not also that uh, simple, but nonetheless, it's, uh, it's quite obvious what you can do with a uh, HTTP. You don't need to uh, second guess things. Uh, so, just like a, just some some general recommendation, when reversing binary format is the first thing that you need to account for is to look for strings, string that ends with the delimiter, the null terminator character, and you have to make sense of uh, types of size one, uh, of size two, of size four depending on the architecture you're dealing with and not the NDNS, whether you're dealing with uh, little NDNS or big NDNS or whatnot. And again, uh, you need not keep focusing on the first byte or first 16 bytes when you're reversing like a, uh, a file of uh, 20K bytes, for example. No, you're gonna have to go through it first or at least not first, a couple of times to look at the entire thing in its entirety, trying to make sense out of it so that you don't lose concentration just by uh, trying to make sense out of this one particular byte. What does it mean in the context of this entire thing? Uh, so yeah. Uh, so after doing all of this, uh, and I, I ended up writing parser, my own parser, but uh, you could use uh, Kaitai, with its own high-level language to write a parser for it. 
although I don't know how would you do it uh, in an easy way. There's a learning curve to it. Or you could use a Blobify. It's a plus plus uh, 17 compatible uh, library that allows you to parse uh, uh, like serialize, deserialize uh, data. But again, it's also not up to the par of uh, what you would want to achieve. It would, require, it would require a lot of work to do the same thing. So I would actually suggest that you uh, write your own parser instead and uh, take it as a learning uh, uh, experience. So I, I wrote it in C++ and it parses uh, all the libraries for all the platforms. And it gives you all of this uh, sensor information uh, from what you saw in all of the uh, documented structures. And it can, of course, extract the library to disk and or the function declaration in uh, XML file. Uh, so to give you an example, there is nothing fancy about it as much as just to uh, prove that it does exist and it works. Uh, so, yeah, so first you give it the uh, library. In this case, I uh, just took as an example, the gadget library. And uh, if you want to print to the console all these uh, fancy structures in a contextual manner, so just like give it the uh, P option. Uh, it prints everything to you, including the function declaration and whatnot. But here, I'm just going to outline some stuff. So this is all the stuff. And what I want to show you is, for example, this particular library is a type 2 library. And you can see it here, like the reference system libraries. So these are the names of the reference system library. In this case, it's Windows, and it's referencing these Windows libraries. This is what I mean by uh, system function declarations. As you can see, this particular library has this huge list of APIs stored in it. So first you have the API name, number of arguments, and then followed by the size of each of the arguments. Yeah, you would be surprised to know that there is a, some of the arguments that hold the size of 40 bytes. If you check the documentation, you will see why. And then the type, as you can see, the type is the lower value and changes per rate I, I have no idea why, and then followed by the uh, uh, like help that describe what this API does. Uh, what else? I mean, uh, you can extract it, just an E, and you get the library. It generates the gadget.lib for you. Uh, you want to add a uh, dump function declaration to an XML file, it generates the XML file for you. And uh, let me see how it looks like. All right, gadget. I'm just gonna hopefully get the uh, So this is the, uh, the list of function declarations and XML from actually you decide to consume them, consume them in one way or another. So they are stored in standardized format. Uh, for the library, I hope I get to the directory this way. Yes. So this is the extracted library. So if you open it with uh, your hex editor, it's here, as you can see, this is of stuff and stuff is well. So now I'm going back to the slides. And again, so to make reversing this uh, even more easier, I wrote another pro plugin, it's written in C++, and uh, it allows you to uh, check if the binary load in IDA is um, a pure basic binary or not, by checking for certain uh, prolog functions. Uh, again, this is all specific to Windows. So I can just work on this for like uh, endlessly and uh, accounting for the Linux and Mac OS version. Hopefully somebody else will uh, pick it from there and add the rest of the functionalities. And of course, I generate uh, um, IDA flare signatures for all the libraries for the uh, Windows uh, version of the compiler. And uh, depending on uh, whether you're dealing with 32 or 64 bit, the plugin will automatically apply their respective uh, flare signatures. So you don't have to do anything. And after applying those signatures, and, and then um, the code becomes clearer, 
you can look up any of those APIs just by right clicking on it and uh, uh, either by uh, going straight to the uh, online documentation or you can move to uh, the uh, uh, CHM help file into the plugin directory and open it uh, from there. It takes you straight to the API. It's it's a uh, it's a very uh, simple uh, plugin, uh, but it just uh, just automates some of the steps for you, so you don't have to wander around. And in case you're wondering how like uh, how the plugin identifies uh, that we're dealing with a pure basic or not, um, like this is for example for detecting 32-bit executables, it checks for this. Uh, particular uh, assembly code snippet, which is actually the prolog of every generated uh, pure basic uh, executable on on Windows, and this is literally how I have this array stored in the code with these wildcards as well. And if you reverse on your pbcomposite.exe file, you will see exactly these uh, assembly instructions uh, being uh, emitted to pure basic .asm file uh, down to the constant. And if you want to take DLL, 32 bit, it has this prologue. I'm gonna I'm not gonna do too much. Uh, I'm not gonna talk too much into this. Um, if you want to detect 64 bit, this uh, this is how uh, I check for that. Now, for generating either for signature, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it or not. I mean, it's not a rocket science. You already have all the tools when you uh, download either SDK and. Uh, so yeah, I really don't know if I should. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm already over time or not. Am I over time, Matt? Okay, awesome. Oh, uh, okay, gotcha. Uh, okay, so for generating a third signature on uh, for any of these libraries that we gathered, uh, first you use this tool called PCF.exe, which is the cost parser. And for other uh, file format parsers, also IDA SDK does come with other parsers. But in this case, we're dealing with cost file format type libraries. So we use PCF.exe. And of course, you have uh, binaries for each uh, uh, platform. And these are all included in the SDK. And this would give, uh, give us the actual uh, library pattern file that we would use uh, to generate the final signature. IDA has great documentation of what these pattern files entail like down to the uh, specifics. Uh, so once you generate that pattern file, you use SIGMAKE, uh, which generate the actual final signature file. And of course, it's an iterative process from this uh, point on, uh, because you might uh, encounter some collision, especially if you have functions with uh, like a few bytes. So those you might have to fix uh, manually, and it's quite easy. I already did that for those I shipped uh, with the plugin. So you didn't have to worry about uh, any of those stuff. But nonetheless, uh, those collisions, they actually, uh, um, they're really not that important because uh, they deal with functions of debug nature. So they don't touch on the actual functionality of a given API that you're sort of afraid of missing on that the uh, that the third file did not auto-identify to you. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's all. It's, it's, it's literally quite easy to generate those essentially. However, it, just keep in mind that you have to have a paid version of IDA to generate uh, those signature files because the SDK is not free. Um, uh, so as, as a case study, just to make sure that this thing actually works. So actually, I didn't mention this at the beginning, like the trigger behind this uh, project. My first encounter with the Pure Basic was in 2015. I looked at a malware at that point in time. Uh, but I didn't write about it or anything like that, just internal work. And um, I didn't do much work on Pure Basic. It just, I got done with that reversing and, and, and that's it. And I'll fast forward to 2019 in November, and Teaser published blog post on what's called Pure Local Ransomware. And it was written in, uh, in, in Pure Basic, and that what got me interested again in Pure Basic and to do all of this work. And so this ransomware is written in Pure Basic. And, uh, I just don't know what version of your basic uh, and it uses some custom functions and time analysis and whatnot. So originally when you load in IDA, you get only 18 out of 231 functions identified. Uh, but after applying uh, those 
uh, Ida Flirt signatures, you will see that uh, 124 will auto label for you uh, out of 237. And, and you can see that an additional six functions were discovered. No wonder, uh, since Ida has more information now. Uh, so just to give you like uh, two screenshots about the difference between the original non-labeled uh, DB versus the labeled one. So as as well, actually this shows that the labeled one. So as you can see, like this is how this is the uh, this is how uh, pure basic uh, API names look like. So really label these for you, and um, uh, so they are self-explanatory. And if you're dealing with the ransomware, you can see the call to these uh, encryption uh, algorithm uh, functions. So you don't have to uh, peer into every function just to figure out uh, uh, what encryption algorithm the, the ransomware is using. What it's already stated for you in the function name. And another example, this is just like I, I literally I took it from the examples directory from Pure Basic. It's an XML file that does um, all it does. It uses the XML library. It loads an XML uh, file from disk and it parses it and displays it in a GUI uh, uh, demo box, type demo box. Originally, I added files only 41 out of uh, 555 functions. After applying the signatures, you get 300 out of 585. And as you can see, I also discovered a new 24 functions. And to see the difference, originally, as you can tell, you have no clue what the uh, what this particular binary is doing after applying the signature, after flirting it, uh, you can see now it makes much, much more sense. You can already know what's doing. Um, um, uh, I mean, this is a uh, this is personal experience, so these might not be challenges for you. Uh, but the uh, the challenge I myself encounter is getting a hold of all of these versions of the basic compiler because on the official website, they also only list uh, the most recent version. And getting access to those old versions just to generate uh, the required their signature for all of them, uh, you don't need to account for the minor releases, at least the major ones. Uh, it's really hard. And even if you go on uh, uh, virus total, it's still hard to find them. Uh, so uh, I don't know how would you find all these uh, prior versions. I'm pretty sure somebody else must have stored them uh, somewhere. Uh, yes, what is left is generating their signatures for Linux and Mac OS. This is literally just from now on, it's just a manual work. Somebody has to do it. And uh, probably update the parser to parse uh, the uh, resident files. And uh, probably uh, add to the plugin um, the capability to uh, load the function declarations and annotate all the uh, identified functions, although I don't see uh, this to be a, a, an important feature. But in, what's important is adding the identification for pure basic uh, Mac OS or Linux binaries. And 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 um, and for dealing with uh, those uh, unidentified pure basic functions uh, or, or those missed uh, on collisions, uh, perhaps, uh, we can use uh, IDA to, to pass plugin and do this uh, like the manual way and generate another set of third signatures that deal only with these uh, uh, unique uh, unidentified functions. So they are shipped under a uh, separate uh, signature file. This is more of a recommendation for anyone who tries to, uh, uh, to write their own parsers when parsing uh, Binary files with dynamic uh, offsets, dynamic lengths, uh, with missing or not missing, just from design perspective, the author doesn't mention the length of what follows, and, and you don't know where to end uh, when, when you parse stuff. Is that it's always, always, at least this is my own uh, learning experience, that if you know what this structure holds in terms of all the data mem members that you have to account for, just take that that blob into a separate buffer and parse it separately. Uh, because you can have a hard time accounting for all of these offsets, especially when you wanna uh, display it out. Because in my parse, I display out all the offsets uh, like correctly, the other other way. Other, other than that, it's literally just a trial and error type endeavor. So you're gonna have to uh, try this, try that, until uh, things start to make sense for you. Uh, perhaps I can show the plugin, it should be. Uh, 
like that. Um, so here, for uh, like this is the XML file that I showed. So this is initially loaded here um, without either third signatures. So if you go right click, Puba helper, first we ask it if it is uh, pure basic uh, binary or not. It says it is a pure basic binary file. Do you want to apply third signature? We say yes. And then it asks you what type of libraries do you want? I mean, by default, we have these first two selected for you since um, you are the most common ones. But if you know you're dealing with DirectX or OpenGL, you can just select them. It doesn't, I mean, hurt to select them too. And then if you click apply, and then you can see that the plugin already auto identified this stuff uh, for you automatically. And just to make it even nicer, you can make it even this way. So as you can tell now, the code is much easier to read. It's all the functions are labeled for you now. And for the case of um, pure locker, it's also the same process. Uh, is it PDO file? So you say yes. And if you go here, you can see these sys underscore, pd underscore, all these label functions for you. So yeah. Um, so yeah, that's it. And um, conclusion, I usually, I don't give conclusion actually. <laughs> I leave it to the uh, uh, to the reader uh, to make up their own conclusions uh, to see if they uh, understood uh, the presentation or not. Uh, and at the end, well, thank you for listening. And I'm sorry again uh, about the uh, uh, hectic beginning with all these technical errors. Thank you. Uh, it's okay. It happens. Thanks for your your presentation, and uh, we'll post it on uh, YouTube. And on the YouTube version, I will cut like the uh, the technical like issues, so it should be like uh, like a bunch cleaner. Uh, oh, it's interesting because I don't know which phone you're using, but the quality is uh, is pretty good actually uh, with the uh, microphone. Uh, oh, oh, not oh, with the, I, not the microphone. The not the microphone, but the actual like uh, phone or cell phone you're using. I mean, the sound is pretty good. Oh, awesome. That's good to know. Yeah. It's a good uh, backup plan, you know, if you ever have any uh, issues. Uh, okay. It's, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a OnePlus phone, just for the record. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Oh, it's so from a cell phone, no? Yeah. Okay, okay. Interesting. Uh, questions from the chat. Uh, Will you share the flirt signatures that you generated? Yes, I do. The flirt signature, the parser, and the IDA plugin, and oh, the very cool. Oh, very cool. Um, and uh, is it another Packer advanced model? Question mark. Pardon, what is that? Uh, is this another Packer's advanced model? It's not a packer at all. This is this is a compiler. It has not to do has it's got nothing to do with a packing or anything like that. Uh and because that guy also uh oh yeah, it was a bit unclear about uh what you were trying to do. Uh like I'm reading the initial like uh messages like oh it seems to micro analyze techniques used by hackers in the wild, pairs of speakers talking about compiling PB to ASM. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Uh, cool. And uh, have you ever seen like a, a malware using Pure Basic? Yes. So for here, actually, surprisingly, on April 2nd, again, uh, Avas actually published a blog about a malware with the installer written actually Pure Basic. And then you have Pure Locker. And then you have the one I encountered in 2015. And then after I did that, actually, I wrote a threat uh, hunting rules, URL rules on BT. And then once, once you run those rules, you will see how many uh, malware written uh, uh, in your basic. There's a lot. Oh, you mean like uh, the rule you were showing before, you used it in, uh, in VT and uh, you're getting some samples now, so you're still looking at them? Exactly. Yeah, because now oh. I am able to fingerprint the pure basic binaries and then I add some specific check 
just to give me an indication whether I'm dealing with a malicious uh, pure basic binary or not. Uh, yes, you will get to see a lot actually. Yeah, that would make sense. It kind of reminds me like uh, back in the days, you know, when people were writing like crack me's in Delphi, uh, when people had uh, to like disassemble uh, them and to look at them, they were like going like, oh, like w what is this, you know, because of P code and everything. So uh, yeah. pure ba actually it's the first time I hear about pure basic. I didn't know at all about pure basic. So it would be uh, quite interesting if you can uh, find a bunch of them. Uh, maybe from the same authors, you know, like or like same group of authors. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, I wouldn't, cool. I wouldn't be surprised because it's it's a cross platform. So. Yeah, I guess instead of like uh, other languages, especially if we, like you said, it's cross platform. Like uh, even like now, like usually we don't see that many like Linux malwares. Uh, so if there's some pure basic malwares running on Linux, you know, uh, that would be like quite interesting to, to watch actually, because even for like regular binaries on Linux, there's like almost no one analyzing uh, malwares. Windows is a lot of people. Mac OS, there's some people. Linux is like, it's almost like dead uh, no man's zone, you know, like uh, as if it does not exist, but we all know there is plenty of stuff. I agree. And usually nowadays they are focusing on... Um targeting IoT devices like you, you get to see a lot of Mirai variants and with additional mm -hmm. functionality like this Linux wise it may not be Linux specific but this is what the, the, the major uh, focus now on the, on the Linux side and for Linux I mean based on my I mean it's it's it's, it's my work is uh, mostly like whenever uh, like an advanced uh, persistent actor wants to target a particular organization then they write of course uh, Linux, uh, Mac OS, or Windows uh, binaries. So they still uh, not as uh, widespread as uh, Windows, as as you mentioned. Yeah, I don't know if it's the less widespread. I mean, definitely, but uh, they're more targeted because, like, cloud. If you just look at cloud operating system, m more than fifty percent of them, like even on Azure, is Linux. Uh, and if you have like some Linux OS, you know, on, on any like cloud providers. Well, it's basically to us like your servers, right? So you know it's going to have valuable information for sure. Whereas like Windows, you know, there's a lot of desktop and everything. So it's kind of like a different landscape, uh, which is a bit of a shame because like if you look at cloud security for like malware, so especially for Linux, it's like, it's just very bad. Exactly. And I, I, I totally agree. I think it's just a matter of time before uh, the attacks start to catch up with the current landscape, like in terms of uh, cloud Linux adaptation. And I think Sophos like recently published uh, a paper about uh, an actual incident targeting uh, cloud uh, yeah. services uh, where where a Linux malware was uh, used. I think Intel also like published some stuff like a few months back. Even internally, like uh, we're very like um, because we have a platform for memory analysis. We're like really focused on uh, on Windows for a while. And last year we kind of like sl started to pivot to focus more a bit on uh, on Linux just because of like cloud OS. This is a huge gap there, oh. and like no one knows how to do anything, you know. It's like, uh, and the, it's a Windows like knowledge like really varies. Like, like you're gonna have some people who are gonna be like really good, but a lot of the people like are gonna be like really average uh, for Windows like uh, analysis, and it's always like the same thing for malware. So it's kind of like difficult to like uh, you know, driven, even if you look at like malware trainings, you know, uh, they kind of like a little bit of the same. You know, it's very basic. Uh, so that's right. interesting to see. Uh, if there is more like pure basic stuff. Have you seen like many people doing research on pure basic uh, before you started to look at it or is it something like- No, uh, I am, I'm actually, I'm actually the only one. That, that there is no prior research in this area. I tried uh, my Google uh, Kung Fu skills to see if somebody else did any research, but none actually. Yeah, but not- uh... And how, how did you find the first like uh, pure basic sample, the one you were looking at? Uh... Oh, back in 2015. Oh, it was in 2015, huh? Oh, wow. 2015, yeah, I know. And I still and have a, the uh, report. And you did the research only now? <laughs> only now, only now, exactly. It's only now. And I didn't pay attention at all at the, at the beginning, like back in 2015. I actually didn't have time to be honest with you as well. It's only now yeah. that I got so interested again at this. And I, I also, I've become wiser and more experienced. So <laughs> yeah, it definitely plays with it. Uh... <laughs> yeah.
And uh, it, it's a commercial language, right? Or is it open source? Uh, no, it is, it is commercial, but it's quite cheap, actually. It's, uh, and, 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 and the license is perpetual. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's very, very, very cheap. Yeah, that's... Uh... Yeah, I'm just checking on the uh, on the internet now actually uh, to kind of see. Uh, yeah, it is pure purebasic.com. What type of people use it like generally? Uh, because it looks like uh, very obscure. Writing, I know it's it used for writing games, uh, databases, editors. Oh. Yeah. All is it like these. a yeah, legacy like, like programming language or? Uh, actually, it does inherit as per the author's. Uh, history of the language he does clearly mention that it tends something from uh, the basic language itself okay like in terms of yeah in terms of like a syntax and whatnot uh, that's uh yeah that's pretty cool well uh let me check if there is more questions in the chat i don't think so uh all the slides and stuff will be available on github uh muhammad i'll send you a, a link uh also like uh i uploaded your, your slides already but you know like all those references you know like for like your the flow signature uh your idea plugin and everything don't hesitate to add them to the readme uh for the the github so like there is also like the like the other references so it makes it like quite easy uh, uh for people to uh to kind of like look at all the information and yeah that's pretty much it well uh th thanks again to you and uh pleasure to uh to have you uh with us on uh, on upcut and uh yeah well thanks a lot for uh for giving me the opportunity to present this work yeah, no, no worries I, I know it's a tough time uh to find a place to to present like stuff now because of the <laughs> the thing um uh, but you yeah, know the, definitely that's really a really cool research and uh actually i was <laughs> i was surprised when i saw your slides because uh, like there's so many i was like oh wow actually you did like a proper like presentation and everything i was like okay cool you know because usually the format is 30 minutes i was like oh this guy actually did like some proper work so like uh, i'm definitely gonna give him an exception Oh yeah, I was actually worried about that, like timing-wise. <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. Okay, well, f thanks again. Have a nice day. Thanks, you too. Bye. 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 Активные мероприятия говорите. Будущее покажет. Добро пожаловать на виртуальный саммит Upcode. And uh, yes, it is. Uh, it is time. It is time to uh, to leave uh, each other. Uh, I hope you guys had a great time before we leave. You know, like obviously, uh, like I was just saying right before, the slides are going to be available on the uh, GitHub repository of Upcode that you are seeing now. Uh, so the slides of uh, Mohammed are actually already uh, available now, and more link will be uh, added so the stream obviously is uh, gonna be available on um, on youtube uh we're also gonna cut the videos for like uh, each of the presentation into individual presentations and if you want to come join uh the community so we have a discord uh, server as i said before uh, you're more than welcome to join it. Uh, we are quite a bunch of uh, uh, people now. Actually, uh, a bunch of people joined uh, during the uh, the presentation, so that's pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, you're more than welcome to come uh, join us also. And yeah, don't forget to subscribe to the uh, channel. Uh, <laughs> so maybe uh, we can make a Costin's uh, dream to. Uh, to have uh, John McAfee here, here true. Uh, but yeah, but more importantly, you know, like you get the notification like every time there is a live presentation uh, or in case we change the, the timing, you know, if we start to go uh, once a week or even, you know, like uh, now, like I was saying, the format is still like once every two weeks, but 
very likely uh, we would like move towards uh, another format where we uh, we like where we would basically like uh, move like every week. Um, we started streaming on Twitch also, so the content is the same now. It's always good to have a backup. Uh, but since it's also easier to stream on Twitch, you know, maybe like in the future, you know, like uh, to do some like ad hoc, like uh, live streams, uh, Twitch would be like the number one platform uh, for that. And uh, yeah, if you're on the Discord server, at least you could just like uh, see uh, all the live streams that we are doing. So more than welcome to subscribe on both, both platform. And yeah, if you have any recommendation for uh, the next uh, upcut, uh, re recommendations are welcome. Uh, like I was saying, um, well, I'm gonna try to do like theme uh, from now on. You know, like you know, like today was like active measure uh, with our, our, our friend doing the the voiceover. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it, it it gives a bit of uh, an interesting like mood uh, mood to it. And um, if there's also a specific speaker you would like to see, uh, don't hesitate to let me know. Uh, some people like send me some names, you know, like uh, I'm gonna reach out to them, or even like if you know them, you can just like tag them on uh, on Twitter and um, yeah, just tell them to uh, to submit. We also have a, a call for paper here, so it's open to everybody. Everyone can submit. And uh, if you have read any like cool blog post, uh, some cool stuff, you know, like there, uh, I mean, I do think like there's a lot of uh, content uh, around now on the internet. It's kind of hard to read like articles. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's kind of nice to be able to like pull the author of a nice blog post to kind of get the, the analysis. Um, because yeah i think there's like a lot of stuff now so it's kind of hard to like get the time to read everything properly uh but yeah that's uh that's pretty much it for today um if you have any questions like uh don't hesitate or any feedback and uh, yeah like um i guess that's uh, pretty much it for uh, today's edition just don't forget to subscribe and like I said before, uh, if you want to donate, we have the uh, donation uh, link for the uh, uh, doctor we, uh, Doctors Without Borders. And uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Uh, thanks again, everyone. And I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I guess I will see you uh, on Discord. And uh, yeah. Активные мероприятия говорите. Будущее покажет. Добро пожаловать на виртуальный саммит Upcode.